good evening everybody well friends first of all sorry to disturb you on a sunday evening but then we have a pleasant duty to i have a pleasant duty to welcome you all on behalf of the foundation for research in digestive and liver diseases here in this occasion we have organized an excellent scientific program related to pancreas and pancreatic diseases with one of the five with the, the finest faculty available in the country the leaders in the field the clinicians research workers surgeons i mean all are there under one roof to address certain important questions in the area of pancreas which we face day to day program is very tight schedule so i'm not wasting much time in the earlier introduction straight away go to the first session first session will have two main case capsules both on the acute pancreatitis one first case will be management in the first week and second will be in the management on the second to fourth week <coughs> for the first case my pleasant duty to introduce the chief moderator dr pramod gar who actually doesn't require any introduction to the indian or even international audience for his exemplary work in the area of pancreas which is recognized respected across the world dr so pramod gar is the professor in gastroenterology at all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and now he has got a is wearing two hats he has a second another important responsibility as a chairman or a director of transnational research institute situated in fidabad so he copes with the two maybe some other time we will talk to him that how he divides his time and how he copes with that two big big responsibilities but you all agree with me that he is one of the world authorities on the area of pancreatitis so straight away over to dr pramod gar i will be of course will be co moderating with him and to talk about acute pancreatitis management in the first one week over to pramod thank you very much sir for this kind of introduction and your invitation to moderate this session on acute pancreatitis as we all know that this is a disease which is very commonly seen in both medical and surgical practice in fact it was shown that it was the commonest indication for inpatient care of hospitalization among all gi diseases in the united states of america and i and i and i know that in most gi departments in our country also acute pancreatitis is one of the commonest indications of hospitalizations and the most important aspect of management of acute pancreatitis resides in the first week of illness when we have to actually look at many many issues with regard to their pain their diet their fluids their antibiotics and many other decisions and in fact in the first week of illness we can identify a patient who is going to you know be all right within a few days or few weeks and someone who is going to have a very prolonged stormy course so first week of illness is the most important and i am very happy to have a distinguished panel here comprising of professor rakesh kochar president who was a president of indian society of gastroenterology professor and head of gastroenterology at pgi chandigarh and who himself has done exemplary work in acute pancreatitis and continues to do so i also have with me dr rajeshwari subramaniam who is professor and head of anesthesia and critical care at all indian institute of medical sciences in delhi and she is someone who is who is excellent in managing very sick patients we always you know rush to her whenever we have a problem with a patient with severe acute pancreatitis also with me are dr mukesh kala a senior gastroenterologist consultant practicing at jaipur and dr somya jagannath mahapatra who is an assistant professor of gastroenterology at aims new delhi and again he is someone who has been working uh, for a long time in acute pancreatitis so welcome all of you uh, to this important session on acute pancreatitis management in the first week of illness 
Now let me begin with the clinical, common clinical scenario of a 55-year-old lady who comes with abdominal pain for a day. Pain is severe, associated with vomitings. Amylase is obviously very high. Chest, the abdominal X-ray and chest X-ray are normal. Her, her heart rate is 102 per minute. Saturation is 92%. She requires two liters of oxygen. Ultrasound shows pancreas is bulky. There is a small fluid collection. She has gallstones. Bilirubin is 1.8 milligram. SGPT is 260 international units. She was diagnosed to have acute pancreatitis and a CT scan was not done. Now, before I just move further, um, at this stage, a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis seems fairly straightforward, but I mentioned a CT scan was not done. So let me ask Professor Kocher, what will he tell his students and, and practitioners whether or not to do CT scan in a patient like this with a typical history of pain and a raised amylase? Professor Kocher, please. So maybe you are mute. I can't really hear you. Professor Kocher? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah sure. Now you can. Yes, sure. Yes, yes. So in this particular patient, the diagnosis is straightforward. There are gallstones. There is elevated bilirubin and elevated SGPT and elevated amylase. So that makes it acute pancreatitis with possibility or rather I would say definite, definitely it is biliary pancreatitis. You don't need to do a CT scan in the first three days in any case in any patient, except if it is if the diagnosis of acute abdominal pain is unsure. That is the only indication when you have to rule out certain other conditions or the basic diagnosis is, is question. If you have evidence of acute pancreatitis with raised amylase or lipase, then there's no need of doing a CT scan in the first 72 to 96 hours. It is only after that that the value of a CT scan comes in when you need to define the uh, degree of necrosis and associated uh, complications thereof. So you don't need a CT scan right. in this case at this stage. So thank you, sir. So, so basically there are two main indications of CT. One, if the diagnosis is still in doubt. And second, when we want to assess local complications, uh, such as infected necrosis, or pseudocyst, ward of necrosis, which would be discussed subsequently. So only when you have a diagnosis in doubt or uh, there is, a, you need to assess the local complication, otherwise it is not required. Now this is day one. The questions for the panelists here are, and these are very relevant questions which we have to address in every patient. Does this patient require hospitalization? When do we refer this patient to a tertiary care hospital? What analysis do we give? How, mu how much fluids to be given? We have discussed CT. Do we, does, the, does the patient require antibiotic? And how about nutrition of this patient? So I'll come each, to each one of them. So when do we refer a patient um, who has got acute pancreatitis and is managed, say, for example, in a primary or a secondary care hospital or in a, in a, in a far off city? So Dr. Mukesh Kala, if you could just tell us uh, when would you like to refer a patient who has got acute pancreatitis on day one you have diagnosed? Uh, thank you, sir. For in particular, uh, a pancreatitis, when we're facing this kind of a situation, I often tell my clinic physicians that consider it as a primary angioplasty. Like if you, for those patients, you documented stone, abnormal biochemistry, and if these patients are having fever, then we, I mean, uh, bring a for these patients for the situation. So referral in biliary pancreatitis with a positive diagnosis is different versus uh, another situation if you have a mild disease it can easily be managed at a primary center by adequate uh, new, I mean, fluid replacement. So thank you Dr. Kala. So basically we need to find out right in the in the beginning whether a patient is going to develop severe pancreatitis or not there are many prognostic markers and scores which could which could guide you to find out whether the patient is likely to have pancreatitis, severe pancreatitis or not. So predict this is known as predicted severe pancreatitis. That you want to predict severe pancreatitis right in the beginning. This is different when you at the end of the clinical illness you say 
whether the illness was acute, mild, moderate, or severe. So that is at the end of the clinical course. But right in the beginning, you want to predict whether it is there or not. So one of the simplest criteria that we could use is persistent SARS. So if you have a patient on day one and he has got SARS, just wait for another 24 hours. If you find SARS is persisting, for example, this lady had tachycardia, or there is increased counts, or there is, you know, uh, respiratory rate is high, then you know there are there, there is SARS. If SARS is persisting in 48 hours, you know this patient is likely to have severe disease. And if you are in a in a center where facilities for intensive care are not available, it is better to refer the patient to a higher center. If the patient is seen on day two or day three, and you find there are already signs of organ dysfunction, for example, this lady required two liters of oxygen to maintain saturation of 92%, then this is a patient who will require to be admitted to a intensive care unit or a center with intensive care unit facilities. So this is an important message I want to give across that whenever you have a patient like this, you should be you should be wary of such patient who has persistent SARS. The major problem of the patient at this stage is pain because the patient has come with pain. Pa patient doesn't know what the investigation show. So what is the right choice of analgesics at this stage? And I'd like to bring Dr. Swami Jagannath that what analgesics would you like to give? What are the choices available to us? And how do we go forward? Uh, so pain is a significant concern in patients with acute pancreatitis and adequate analgesia should be the goal. So there are three groups of drugs for analgesia, the opiates, NSAIDs, and the anesthetic drugs. So out of the trials uh, which are done in versus opiates and NSAIDs, there are four trials, but uh, three did not show any benefit on one trial. It showed that there is a kappa opiate receptor agonist uh, pentajosine, which is better than NSAIDs in terms of adequate analgesia and more hours of pain-free interval. So uh, to choose uh, in a patient with acute pancreatitis, uh, so opiates are better than uh, NSAIDs, in for analgesia so uh, how much should be given so uh, in general analgesia should be given around the clock uh, six hourly or eight hourly depending on the analgesia so if you want to give diclofenac 75 mg it should be given thrice a day or if you want to give pentajosin or tramadol it should be given thrice a day so believe me apart from giving round the clock analgesia patient have significant pain and uh, in a randomized control trial which has done in our center we have seen that apart from giving round the clock analgesia we need to give adequate uh, additional analgesia which are the rescue analgesic drug and the rescue analgesic drug we normally prefer short acting potent opioids such as uh, fentanyl so fentanyl should be uh, given uh, not more than 0.1 to 0.15 mic uh, in an hour so for a patient of 50 kg it should not be given more than uh, 50 to 75 mic in an hour and uh, in our rc2 we have seen that patient despite giving thrice diclofenac or uh, pentajosin they require up to 200 to 300 mic fentanyl uh, as a rescue so, till so what you are saying is that there are two choices either opioids or NSAIDs. there are concerns with each of the analgesics class for example, NSAIDs, there is a possibility of renal failure or GI bleeding. Opioids may lead to ileus or respiratory depression. And because there are not many data, I think you were referring to the study that you conducted of opioid versus diclofenac, a randomized trial in acute pancreatitis, where patients were randomized to either diclofenac or pentazosine, intravenous eight-hourly intervals given, and fentanyl was given as a rescue analgesic. Uh, through a patient control analgesia pump pca pump and and what was found is that that pentazosine was better than diclofenac in terms of better uh, pain relief and less requirement of of rescue analgesia in in the form of fentanyl so there is another study from pgi which showed that tramadol and diclofenac are almost similar in terms of pain relief so the take-home message here is that overall, if you look at patients with, with pancreatitis, most people will prefer to give opioids to them. And if required, you can give other analgesics like paracetamol or NSAID, or what we prefer is a fentanyl. One thing that I would like to highlight here is that a patient-controlled analgesia pump, PCA pump we have found, is a very good 
way of giving rescue analgesia to these patients. This really relieves their pain very well. And we have been using for last about five, six years regularly in these patients. So this is very important. Now, there is another thing that uh, we need to discuss, and that is about epidural anesthesia. And I'll bring in Dr. Rajeshwari here. Madam, uh, could you just tell us about uh, epidural analgesia in patients with acute pancreatitis for providing pain relief? I would like to thank the panel and Dr. Pramod and everyone for uh, inviting me to this very august uh, collection of people. Uh, and at the outset, I would say that there is a Cochrane review which evaluated the effects of NSAs in pancreatitis and did not find that any of the studies were actually powered enough to give proper results. But having said that, um, we have two issues. We have uh, resource constraints in our country, <laughs> so which uh, you know which lead to the use of whatever is available. Oh, I'm so thankful. You already projected the slide, is it? And this was the Cochrane review. So uh, apart from that, now when we come to uh, the disc uh, why why are we worried about the pain in pancreatitis is now the central question. Because why what does pain do to pancreatitis, which actually lands the patient into trouble is that it has been shown that the more the pain, the more is the likelihood of and a highly inflamed pancreas, which is releasing inflammatory mediators and well, as well as uh, cytokines in the microcirculation, which affect the lungs as in, and they produce and they lead to ARDS finally. Now, after having uh, seen COVID, we all know, you know, the effect of uh, in, increased inflammatory markers on the lungs, the kind of inflammation and respiratory failure they produce. A similar picture is actually results from acute pancreatitis if, if the pain in, in a subset of patients who are going to progress to severe acute pancreatitis. So the uh, idea is that it's a very interesting uh, sort of thought that is it is is if we control pain and if we improve the splanctic circulation and improve the circulation in the penumbra region of the pancreas which has got inflamed, are we will we be able to reduce or hasten the healing or shorten the duration of inflammation? Because that is probably what is translating improved recovery in patients and there have been now many trials almost two trials every year is coming out which initially started off with pigs the study of backman on pigs is what dr pramod is projecting on the screen right now so it was seen that uh, pigs who had a severe pancreatitis induced and who had received epidural analgesia before uh, uh, they showed a return to the splanctic circulation almost reaching the pre-inflammatory uh, levels, whereas those pigs which were the controls showed an acute reduction in splanctic circulation and died. So uh, now the question is centering around that the thoracic epidural analgesia probably improves the microcirculation in pancreatitis and therefore it is responsible for the results that we are seeing and it's a very exciting field of research. But then comes the question of when to time the epidural as Dr. Pramod was asking. So uh, I feel that initially if you give a trial of the normal conventional analgesics that is uh, tramadol or uh, pentazosine or PCA fentanyl and find that the patient does not improve especially in terms of tachycardia or tachypnea or develops new lung signs and uh, nowadays we can even get the inflammatory markers done the IL-6 levels done if all of these are rising then it's a very ominous sign that the patient is actually progressing towards acute pancreatitis and amelioration of the pain could to a certain extent help his pancreatic microcirculation thank you so thank you madam that's very nice because this is something that we often do not discuss uh, in uh, in our uh, meetings that how do we control pain in these patients and as you have very rightly said that uh, 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 epidural analgesia is something that we should be, I think, looking at uh, in, in terms of providing better analgesia. And also now there is some evidence that uh, uh, it can it can uh, it can also decrease the severity of the illness. So that is something that has to be looked at uh, whether or not it decreases severity or not. So uh, moving on, the next major issue in patients with uh, acute pancreatitis is about fluid. So most patients who have got pain are kept nil by mouth at least for the first few days and that is the that is the reason they require iv fluids in addition there is some fluid loss in in these patients so uh, in the first few days day one to three my questions to panelists would be what's the usual fluid deficit in acute pancreatitis what should be the rate and type of fluid replacement and how do we guide fluid therapy dr coach if you could ask you that 
uh, what's your opinion about the usual fluid deficit in these patients? Because there are reports of saying there are six to eight liters of fluid loss and that much of fluid to be given. So this is, I think, an important question. What culture, please? So you might be mute if I'm not wrong. Fluid uh, replacement is probably the most important factor in the management of acute pancreatitis. Pain relief is obviously for the patient uh, comfort and uh, alleviating discomfort. But fluid re replacement can even reverse pancreatic necrosis or prevent the degree of necrosis. So till very late, it was not clear that how much fluid is actually lost. And there were some studies about 15 years ago, including some from Mayo Clinic, which suggested a very aggressive fluid uh, replacement to the tune of 500 ml per hour, amounting to 6 to 12 liters a day. But then we had this study from uh, D-Medaria et al, which calculated that over 48 hours in a patient of mild disease, that means without necrosis, the sequestration of fluid was around 3.2 liters in 48 hours. And in patients with pancreatic necrosis, it was 6.4 liters in 48 hours. So this was very elegantly shown that this is the amount of fluid which should be replaced. And this somehow very closely mimicked what was projected, not shown, but projected by Renson et al. way back 50 years ago, that the fluid loss is nearly the same as was actually shown by Medaria et al. So we, we don't need to replace 6 to 12 liters a day. We need to be more uh, sure about how much fluid we are doing. And for that, we have... Uh, now it is um, goal-directed fluid replacement therapy. How aggressively should the fluids be replaced? As I said, those studies which showed 250 to 500 ml per hour were shown to actually lead to uh, complications with renal failure, pulmonary failure, increase in intra-abdominal hypertension. So now the consensus is that you do not do over replacement the maximum fluid you will replace is about 4 to 4.5 liters in the first 24 hours and one way to do that is in the first instance when the patient is admitted hospitalized at that time you give a bolus of about 20 ml per kilogram so that will amount to 1000 to 1200 for a weight weight of 60 to 65 kilograms and follow it with a reasonable amount of fluid that is about 100 to 200 milliliter per hour so amounting to 2.5 to 3 liters in that day on that day that means maximum of about 4 to 4.5 liters in the first 24 hours thank you sir so so the the point we are discussing here is that not every patient is going to have a high fluid loss so that idea of giving 6 to 8 liters of fluid is an old concept and almost given up. Uh, may I ask Dr. Rajeshwari at this stage that in an ICU when patient is admitted with severe disease, in general, regardless of pancreatitis, what is it that you would like to monitor and give fluids? I mean, what determines your fluid intake and requirement? How do you decide that? So, uh, Dr. Pramod, uh, regardless of, as you said, pancreatitis, we have a lot of indices in the ICU. And now with uh, advanced monitoring, the goal-directed therapy has been uh, sort of left behind. There are a few goals, of course, which we want to reach. But first is to assess whether the patient is actually fluid deficient or not. So for this, we can actually make use of the ultrasound very nicely whereby we can see the IVC collapsibility index. We can see whether the IVC is full. Sometimes the IVC may be difficult to see in the presence of a lot of ileus in the abdomen, but we can use echocardiography to see the cardiac filling, and we can also see the cardiac output and calculate the cardiac output. And um, nowadays we have uh, uh, devices like the PICO, which tell us about the general vascular volume, the amount of blood in all the four ventricles and also in the pulmonary compartment. So looking, looking at those new modalities, we can decide whether a patient is actually fluid deficient or not. So if the patient is not fluid deficient, then comes the role of early vasopressors. And we prefer to use noradrenaline in a patient who's not fluid depleted. We also use indices like pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation, which are calculated from the 
arterial pulse trace of these patients. And uh, I must tell you that any patient who is admitted into the ICU does get an invasive arterial line because it gives us an enormous amount of information apart from uh, our ability to do blood gases, you know, very uh, frequently. So we calculate from all these indices whether, first of all, the patient is def uh, is deficient in fluids or not. So in, so, patient, so in general, what you're saying is that that monitoring is very important to assess whether the patient is fluid deficit or not, I think. And CVP nowadays is not considered a good guide. If possible, I mean, all patients should have arterial line, particularly those who have hypotension. So that goes without saying that someone who is in ICU uh, should have an inter IV line, the arterial line. Uh, how about this non-invasive uh, monitoring that uh, nowadays is being, you know, recommended? And we do that actually quite commonly in our patients. Uh, with uh, looking at the IVC diameter and lung ultrasound. The IVC diameter uh, is definitely a very good index, but uh, it uh, you have to see whether the patient is being mechanically ventilated or whether the patient is breathing spontaneously. In the case of spontaneously breathing patients, we use the collapsibility index. How much does the IVC collapse? So if we if the IVC collapses by more than 50% of its original diameter, then we consider that the patient is fluid deficient. But a more uh, sensitive uh, response is given by the increase in the cardiac output with fluid challenge. So uh, with a rapid fluid challenge of 250 to 500 ml, we see we keep doing the echocardiography continuously. Nowadays, we have the facility of doing echo on our own in the ICU. So we see the uh, output from the, the velocity time integral or the speed with which blood is ejecting the left ventricle. So that gives us a very good idea of the cardiac output. So it's a very uh, um, uh, it's kind of you have to make a comprehensive judgment of whether the patient is fluid deficit because as Dr. Kocher very correctly pointed out, over transmission in these patients can be very, very hazardous. It can actually precipitate compartment syndrome and pulmonary edema, which we are trying to avoid. So it is of right. the essence to measure uh, whether to see and with as many parameters as possible, you to see his urine output, whether he's into renal shutdown or not, that could be one reason of hypervolemia as well. So, uh, right, uh, right. in a comprehensive way, the volume status is evaluated and then we proceed. If the right. volume is okay, then we have a very, very low threshold for starting noradrenaline to maintain the blood pressure if required. Right. So, that's an important point you have just mentioned that what happens is a patient is hypotensive, suppose on day two or so, then you are giving a lot of fluids and patient is not responding. Then what people do is they give more and more fluids and that causes problem. So, you know, two studies recently shown that some increased amount of fluids, the aggressive fluids might be better in patients with mild acute pancreatitis. But in severe pancreatitis where there is a problem, you know, hypotensive, if you give more fluid, it may lead to more problems as you have just rightly mentioned. Let me bring in Dr. Swami Jagannath here who has actually published an editorial in gastroenterology uh, early this year about optimal fluid therapy uh, in acute pancreatitis. So, so, uh, Soumya, if you could just explain these two figures that you have put in there. So this is about mild and then we'll go, come to this severe also. Actually, the editorial was completed by Dr. Garg. So uh, in mild acute pancreatitis, the hemodynamic perturbations are not, are not much. There is no systemic inflammation. There is minimal fluid leak. So whatever be the fluid you give to the patient that is excreted by the urine and the fluid, uh, uh, the amount of fluid administration does not really matter much. As compared to patient with severe acute pancreatitis. No, no. Uh, so, they, so first complete this. First complete this, yes. So, in patient with uh, uh, mild acute pancreatitis, there is no systemic inflammation. So, if even if you don't give, even if you give aggressive fluid, there is no problem because patient will have you know adequate diuresis and no organ dysfunction. So that's an important point. A mild mild disease, you give four liters, five liters doesn't matter. Patient will have diuresis and there will not be a problem. I think we have lost his connection, but doesn't matter. So, but the problem comes in patients with severe pancreatitis. So in severe pancreatitis, what happens is that there is systemic inflammation. There is a lot of cytokines are being secreted. And in these patients, what happens? Some of your back, so you can just continue with severe. What happens in severe? So in severe acute pancreatitis, there is a, a lot of cytokines which are secreted in the systemic circulation with damp and free fatty acids, uh, which go into the bloodstream. And they uh, the pathophysiological changes which happen in the bloodstream and at the capillary and endothelial level is there is a lot of fluid sequestration into the interstices.
So, so what happens is that if you have a lot of uh, cytokines there and there is vascular injury, there is more fluid in the, in the interstitium and there is a leaky capillary. This is a leaky capillary syndrome. And then what happens then you have tissue, uh, you know, uh, hyperperfusion, organ dysfunction. And th then in addition to that, there are cytokines and free fatty acids, which also lead to these organ dysfunction. So the problem here is if you now focus on the, the blue lines here, the blue lines here, if you give aggressive flu to these patients, what happens? There is more leak. There is more leak, there is more edema, and there is more organ dysfunction. So, so what is the problem in patients who have severe disease or predicted severe pancreatitis? The moment you give more fluids and there is a leaky capillary, there is more problem in these patients. And that is why one has to be very careful in giving fluids in them. Dr. Mukesh Kala, what is it? What type of fluid would you recommend to these patients? We have discussed about the rate of fluid, but what fluids will you prefer? Sir, uh, we have... Uh, if we can have it just one line rather than going to details because running yeah, short yeah. of time, yeah. just give a carry home message. The primarily, this fluids should be used and uh, this has been extensively studied and documented also. So normal saline and uh, ringer lactate are reasonable solutions to be, reasonable fluids to be used for uh, this kind of volume expansion at the beginning of the day. So in general, ringer lactate is considered better than normal saline because normal saline may lead to hyperchloremic acidosis and lactate possibly may downregulate inflammation. So ringer lactate is considered to be better than normal saline in general. We have discussed how do we monitor these patients and the recommendations Dr. Kocher has mentioned that in, in general, we advise three to four liters of ringer lactate in 24 hours, depending on the fluid assessment as pointed out by Dr. Rajeshwari and the severity of acute pancreatitis. Beyond the first three days, this is important, beyond the first three days of illness, it doesn't really matter that, you know, uh, how much has been fluid given or earlier, you have to assess the deficit. Now, don't give six to eight liters of fluid who, to a patient who comes in with oliguria or hypertension after three days. After three days, you have to give according to the output. So that's again an important point. Now, moving on, uh, uh, quick, quickly uh, move on. Uh, Pramod, uh, uh, Pramod, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, because I know that we have uh, left with the nutrition part, but uh, could I suggest that we take two questions which are come up relevant to that and can conclude after uh, the whole thing, so, because otherwise we'll over time. So, so huh? what we will do is, in about two, three minutes, I will quickly come to the nutritional part. Yes, I know. absolutely. And yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I have one or two questions uh, for you. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, I'll pass yeah. it. So, so what happened to this patient was that she had fever, counts were slightly raised. But the problem is that she had organ dysfunction. And I want to emphasize here that on day two to day, day four, or in the first week of illness, organ failure is very important. And this is the key to deter key determinant of survival in these patients. This could be either early or sometimes it is late due to sepsis and infected necrosis. And we have shown that both primary and secondary organ failure may cause you know, uh, mortality and should be distinguished. In mortality in patients who have got persistent organ failure may be as high as 42%, as I've shown in three studies published recently from, from India, from Dutch, and from Spain. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any treatment for that. And uh, in, in, in the near future, I, I doubt if we have any specific therapy for 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 organ dysfunction, except managing these patients in the ICU. I'm not going to discuss antibiotics. Suffice would be to say that there is no role of prophylactic antibiotics in the first week of illness in patients with acute pancreatitis. And that brings me to nutrition. So when do we start mild, severe? So Dr. Ajay Kumar, if you could just ask your questions, please, before we move further. And I think we'll finish up oh, yeah. on time. Uh, see, uh, uh, good discussion, but good uh, questions coming from the delegates. So before I pass it on to Pramod, there's one question which I can quickly take up because it has not been discussed in a part of this. The question was acute severe biliary pancreatitis when to intervene for therapeutic ERCP. Just one line answer. When you're looking at a therapeutic early ERCP, you are not looking at the severity. The only indication of intervention, early intervention, when you are reasonably confident that patient has got cholangitis. Other than cholangitis, there is no indication of an emergent uh, ERCP or a biliary intervention. 
the question to pramod do there are two questions do nsets increase the occurrence of aki we have been talking about the use of nsets in the management of pain are you worried about that or not and what is the uh, uh, literature evidence and secondly the patient mild or severe if they are tolerating oral fluids what is your choice iv or oral fluids for that thank you sir so first of all about nsets the simple answer is that there is no definite evidence that NSAIDs increase renal failure in patient with acute pancreatitis. However, if a patient has increased urea or creatine, I won't give NSAID. So in the beginning, I can if the, if the hydration status is OK and urea and creatine are normal. So with regard to the, the oral or the IV fluids, if patient has very minimal pain or we have given analgesics, on the day on day one also, you can give oral fluids. There is no problem. But I think most patients would require some supplementation with IV fluids. So my question to panelists is that uh, in mild and severe pancreatitis, when do we start the fluid? And and what? how do you give fluid? Dr. Kocher, if you could just tell us uh, something about this. Oral feeding, Dr. Yes. Kocher, you are asking in mild pancreatitis. Yeah, we can start as early as possible. In any case, oral feeding should be started. Oral means elemental feeding should be started within the first 24 to 48 hours to have uh, the actual benefit. So if the patient can tolerate orally, which generally you will wait for 24 hours, after that you can start oral feeding. If the patient tolerates it, it is fine. Otherwise, you place a nasogastric or nasoenteral tube and start oral feeding. So, so what is the indication for enteral tube feeding? Enteral is if you have uh, intolerance to oral feeding or intolerance to nasogastric tube feeding, then you place a tube in the naso uh, by the naso jejunal route. Doctor Mukesh Kala, do you prefer nasogastric, naso jejunal, or oral? Yeah, sir. The but if the abdominal pressure then the will give the patient a problem, so it will be better. So earlier thoughts about pancreas is uh, uh, scientifically documented, except for the situation down the line, third or fourth week, the head edema becomes a problem. If it is the compartment some problem with this. Yeah. So, uh, Swami, if you could just tell us when would you like to place a nasal jejunal if you're still around? Yes, sir. Uh, so, when uh, patient, so if uh, initially we prefer to give enteral, if a not tolerable, we give nasogastric. If there is too much of intolerance in the term of terms of vomiting or there is too much uh, inflammatory edema and the, uh, the duodenum, which uh, uh, leads to uh, uh, gastric outlet obstruction type of feature, we need to bypass that area. We need to place a nasogastric tube to give adequate. So, nutrition. basically, it depends on the tolerability of the patient, and most patients will, will tolerate oral or nasogastric. Some patients give nasogestional, polymeric diet is okay, and the target calories is around 25 to 30 kilocalories per kg in most patients, and we rarely rely on, on TPN nowadays. So let me summarize in the, uh, uh, the points that we have discussed today. Uh, first few days are critical in patients with acute pancreatitis. We need to provide them adequate optimum hydration, not overhydration. Analgesics, opioids are generally preferred. We need more data on epidural anesthesia, as pointed out by Dr. Rajeshwari. Early enteral nutrition is the key, and we can start within a few days, two, three, four days uh, of, of illness. No prophylactic antibiotics uh, to be given in these patients. With this, I, I finish my, my follow Oh, yeah. Thanks, uh, Pramod. I know I pressed hard for the time, but it, uh, I think the, these important issues are discussed so well in this uh, half an hour with the expert. And, uh, uh, you'll excuse, uh, <clears throat> I know delegates are all enjoying it, but you'll excuse me because we have to stick to the time uh, schedule and conclude the things at the right time. And thanks, uh, Pramod, and thanks to all the panelists, um, uh, Dr. Kocher, Dr. Rajeshwari, Dr. Kalla, and Dr. Swamya, for a wonderful, uh, clear carry-home messages.
of the management of a key packet letter in the first week. With this, we move on to the second case capsule for today. And I pass on the mic to Dr. Neha to introduce the coordinators and then move ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, sir. So we are now moving on to our second case capsule for the evening, which is management of acute pancreatitis in the second to the fourth week. And the moderator for the session is Dr. Mahesh Goenka and the co-moderator, Dr. Randeep Sood. So both need no introduction. Dr. Goenka is the director and head at the Institute of Gastroenterology and Liver Transplant at Apollo Clinicals Hospital, Kolkata. He is the president elect of the of Gastroenterology, past president of SGI, and governor of the Indian region of American College of Gastroenterology. Dr. Randhir Sood is the chairman of Institute of Digestive and Hepatobiliary Sciences at Vedanta Medicity. He is also the past president of the Society of GI Endoscopy of India. I welcome both the moderator and the co moderator. Dr. Mahesh, could you please kindly introduce the panelists to start the session? Thank you. Randhir. Randhir. Thank you, Neha, and uh, thank you, Ajay, for inviting me. and. Uh, I know Mahesh has uh, put in a lot of effort in preparing the capsule for the next uh, talk. Uh, I have it's my uh, pleasant duty to introduce a very balanced panel here uh, with us today to address these issues. Dr. Ajesh Gupta, who is a GI surgeon from PGI Chandigarh, and Dr. Pankaj Gupta, who is an uh, interventional radiologist, particularly doing GI interventions in PGI Chandigarh. Then we have Zahir Nabi from uh, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. I didn't see him in the, uh, you know, in the panel so far. And then uh, we have Dr. K. K. Rawal, uh, a very eminent gastroenterologist from uh, from uh, Rajkot. So we have two gastroenterologists, one GI surgeon and one interventional radiologist. Very well thought of panel because uh, uh, they have all very important role in the, this period of two to four weeks. Over to Mahesh. Mesh, you're muted, I think. Okay, is my slide seen there? Yeah, we can see. Yes. Okay, so thank you, Randhir, and uh, thank you, Dr. Neha. Uh, let me uh, now move on to this uh, case capsule presentation for the second to the fourth week. And as uh, Ajay has focused his further and he wants me to mainly discuss managing the fluid collection in two to four weeks. So, uh, Randhir has already introduced the panelist. We have a esteemed uh, group of panelists here. So, as rightly pointed out by uh, Pramod, in the first week, it's pain, fluid, nutrition, and the organ failure, which is the most important component of the management. But once you reach the second week, while you continue to manage the nutrition of the organ failure, I think collections, sepsis become more important to take him, take the patient through these crucial second to fourth week. And this is what we are going to discuss in the next few minutes. So, as I rightly said, that nutrition, organ failure, sepsis, and fluid connections are the most important component in second to four weeks. And what we will be highlighting in next 25 to 27 minutes is to talk to you about fluid collection and sepsis with the help of our panelists. So this is a very common slide we have all seen, but let me just recapitulate that uh, now the terminology is that it can be either interstitial pancreatitis or necrotizing pancreatitis when there's a collection in interstitial pancreatitis in the first four weeks, we, we call it acute peripancreatic collection in necrotizing pancreatitis, it's acute necrotic collection. And after four weeks, when the wall forms, it becomes cirrhosis on this side and wall of necrosis on uh, the side of necrotizing pancreatitis. So this is a, a, a a uh, group of people who are evaluated, 189 patients with acute pancreatitis because of the bias, 81% had necrotizing pancreatitis, and majority of them developed acute necrotic collection. Now, if you wait for four weeks, some of them will develop world of necrosis, and some will resolve. But we are concerned about this uh, significant proportion of patients, almost about 20%, who would expire before you reach that four weeks period, and what we are going to discuss is, can we salvage some of these patients by intervention? So this is my first case capsule, a 29 years old gentleman admitted with us 5th of June with no background illness, recent history of COVID, who had acute onset of pain, abdomen, pancreatitis since 28-5. So he was admitted to us almost about seven to eight days later, associated with multiple episodes of vomiting and developed fever in the range of 100.5 to 101. 
so he had tachycardia he has tachypnea but otherwise was normal his uh, investigation showed leukocytosis his procalcitonin was high and there was slight abnormality in the liver function so we did that ct scan and this shows acute necrotizing pancreatitis modified ct severity index of 10 by 10 with multiple peripancreatic collections so there was perigastric collection this paracolic gutter collections bilateral pleural effusion so initially as promos said it was managed by iv fluids painkillers nasal oxygen required bipap major major jejunal feeding and was also started the antibiotics towards the later part of the first week but he continued to be sick and with high fever so this patient now has persistent fever leukocytosis he has serous positive his increasing oxygen requirement he continues to have pain abdomen and we in our unit in icu man monitor intraabdominal pressure by this technology which is very simple advisor uh, me uh, measurement of intravesical and intraabdominal pressure and we found the intraabdominal pressure was increasing almost to the level of acute compart abdominal compartment syndrome so what we did in this particular patient is that we put two nine french catheters one in the perigastric uh, collection and the other one is a paracolic gutter and this showed degenerated cells amylase was moderately high and it grew clepsia so my first question is to dr rawal uh, that when do you think we should intervene in this period of 2 to 4 weeks uh, dr rawal is dr rawal there dr zahir is there yes can you hear ah yeah dr rawal okay sir thank you for giving me this opportunity sir uh, the most common indication for intervention in 2 to 4 weeks as you rightly said is the sepsis that is multi organ failure and infection other than that there may be gastric outlet obstructions or biliary obstructions nausea vomiting pain failure to take oral intake these are the most common indication i think the infection is the most common indication of intervention in 2 to 4 weeks so i'll just put this on a table form so the five common indications for early intervention for fluid collections in 2 to 4 weeks is proven infected pancreatic necrosis clinically suspected infected pancreatic necrosis with ongoing organ failure and wellness this is a loose term which is used for continuing pain nausea and vomiting and nutritional failure organ compression as dr rawal said we can be in the form of gastric outlet obstruction biliary obstruction intestinal obstruction abdominal compartment syndrome and rarely i would say in this period for disconnected pancreatic duct so uh, gandhir you would like to make any comment here before we move on gandhir you need to unmute yourself you know there is a situation where you have a patient with the now the second week and uh, the, the counts are rising and you see that the procal is also high then you will uh, suspect infection and particularly if the patients uh, you know uh, is developing a new onset organ failure then you will like to uh, in uh, see for any collection and you want to intervene because that will definitely drain the infected material and this will be important because both for getting the targeted antibiotics as well as draining the infected fluid and many times patients with the uh, even no infection have necrotic fluid collections which after drainage can lead to amelioration of uh, fever and uh, uh, discomfort of the patient so um, the modality of intervention when you decide to do the intervention for the discussions which we had can be either percutaneous catheter drainage it can be endoscopic drainage in a limited number of patients which we we'll discuss in of course surgery which may be a stuff for phenomenon but we all agree that the main mechanism of intervention in these patients is percutaneous catheter drainage and this is aga guideline published a uh, few months back which clearly says percutaneous drainage of pancreatic process should be considered in patient with infected or symptomatic necrotic collections in the early acute period 2 to 4 weeks without the presence of a wall of collection and a failing conservative medical management So my question to Dr. Pankaj Gupta uh, from PGI Chandigarh is: uh, What are the special techniques for continuous catheter drainage? What route should be preferred? What size of catheter drainage? And how do we get the best results out of these catheter drainage? Dr. Pankaj Gupta, who has published in this particular field quite a bit, I would also want Dr. Rajesh Gupta, who, though he is a surgeon, has already published a number of articles on this aspect. Dr. Pankaj, first. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Uh, regarding the technique, uh, uh, first would be the modality of uh, choice for uh, guidance of uh, drainage, and uh, uh, if the collection is well seen on ultrasound, we would prefer ultrasound as a modality. Though in certain centers, CT is the modality of choice for drainage. 
in our center we do most of our intervention on ultrasound and if uh, in, the collections are deep in the lesser tract or contain air then we resort to ct regarding the route of drainage if the collection is accessible through the retroperitoneal route we prefer to put the catheter between the uh, uh, the uh, colon and the uh, spleen that is through the retroperitoneal route along the long axis of the collection however in in many patients the retroperitoneal route is not uh, uh, uh like uh, accessible so we go through the uh, transperitoneal route and uh, access the collection directly in the lesser sac regarding the size of catheter uh, we use a large bore catheter and we start with fortin french catheter that is the policy which we have in our uh, unit that we start with a fortin french catheter and then depending upon the uh, the drainage and the response to catheter drainage we uh, go ahead with further upgradation or upsizing uh, there are several ways to improve the results of uh, percutaneous catheter drainage and these include the use of a proactive uh, protocol where the researchers have shown that if we drain all the collections as was shown in this index patient that we are not sure that which collection is infected so if you go ahead and drain all the collections and frequently upsize the catheters that comprises a proactive protocol that has been shown to uh, do better than a protocol of standard treatment and then as already been highlighted earlier drainage if there is a doubt of infected collection we go ahead and drain early so that the inflammatory cascade can be stopped at an earlier stage rather than waiting for it to progress few studies have also shown that uh, the use of a double bore catheter and in our center we have shown a kissing catheter technique where we put two catheters side by side may also help drain more necrotic components than the fluid components and finally then there is a role for intracavitary treatment comprising of streptokinase hydrogen peroxidase though they are in like preliminary stage and also the use of uh, intracavitary antibiotics that again data is limited for that so uh, dr gupta has very nicely uh, summarized his experience as well as the literature so i just shown on a on a diagram here that you may choose any route there are the multiple routes which are possible but as he rightly said if you have a good retroperitoneal approach that is usually preferred by most of the intervention radiologists but uh, the root is not a limiting factor and you can even grow through the liver if required and uh, drain it now as dr gupta said that usually you prefer the larger size that's our policy as well but it also depends on the root and the safety so sometimes you start with a small one we have in our unit sometimes put 24 and even 32 french catheters in the very beginning itself because that uh, accelerates the process but i would agree that most of the time it's 14 14 french catheter which is usually preferred you can either use a pigtail catheter or a melicots catheter you can use either a sandiger or technique or a trocar technique dr gupta mentioned that he does most of it ultrasound and uh, there may be a variation in our unit we do most of the ct scan guided and i would like to uh, uh, talk to talk about this particular trial which is ongoing which is called pointer trial which is to uh, decide what should be the time of intervention so there are two arms in this one is very early intervention within 24 hours and the other one is a standard of care so the results are awaited this is a large dutch study which is being carried out so dr gupta has also talked about how pcd itself is sufficient in 35 to 51% of the patient with pancreatic necrosis and this is mentioned in the recent article for todd baron now uh, dr gupta talked about but i show i, I thought i'll show it on a slide for better take home message that the larger the tube the better of course you have to look at the safety he talked about multiple tubes and the kissing tube techniques now saline irrigation now is becoming a standard of care you can either do a continuous irrigation or a periodic inter 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 installation streptokinase irrigation i would request dr rajesh gupta to talk about it after i finish this slide he has published some data on streptokinase irrigation and 150000 units is what he used dr gupta also talked about aggressive protocol where you go in increasing the size of the catheter in every 2 to 3 days and add additional catheters and if all these fail you can do a dual modality where you can step up to surgery or an endoscopic technique before i proceed uh, dr rajesh you would like to make any comment here uh thank you sir uh i think the the basic premise of using this pigtail catheter is to have an unin uninhibited drainage of the collections so i i personally do not think and we have not experienced that the size really matters a 10 to 12 french if it is achieving this purpose is good enough because most of the time what we are draining is an infected tube 
however to augment the drainage to augment the uh, uh, utility of this tell uh, pankaj uh, did elaborate on the proactive use and we i, I mean we do the same uh, together and uh, in, in fact if the cavity is large sometimes we, we put more than one catheter where one catheter uses we use as an ingress and the other catheter as egress so that can take care of most of the infected fluids and some of the uh, floating necrosum which is there and a source of infection problem is when when the necrosum in cavity constitutes more than 50% of the component so that is the uh, scenarios where the efficacy of pictus catheter can be low and there we use adjuncts and streptokinase we found as a effective adjunct in you know it reduces the need of surgery in another 20 to 25% like the patient where we used streptokinase the requirement of surgery was 34% compared to 54 54% in patients who did not uh, who were only on saline and when i say saline we are not using saline 50 ml three times a day we are using saline three to four liters a day so uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta. Um, uh, we must not forget that there can be complications with PCD, there can be fistula, there can be vascular injury, there can be pain. This is one of our patients with which he reported and after the drainage patient developed colocystic fistula between the left colon and the collection and this was closed by Ovesco clip with a stent. So we must not forget that PCD can have its own complication. Now, if PCD by itself does not work, then can you, you can step up the procedure and this is what is known as pen or percutaneous endoscopic necrosectomy. So this patient, we had large bore catheter and in this situation, we usually would uh, put 32 French catheter either from the very beginning or upscale it. And then after a track is matured in about 10 days time, we go through this trinus track and do a necrosectomy. I know Pramod has published a large series uh, recently. Uh, he has two papers on this, but we also published some of the data where we found this technique to be very useful and you can remove large amount of necrotic tissue through this percutaneous endoscopy necrosectomy as an addition to uh, percutaneous catheter drainage. Now let me move quickly to the second case. And again, Dr. Gupta, I would want that this patient did not have a wall formed. We tried a catheter drainage, failed, and then ultimately a minimally invasive surgery was done and this is what was removed as minimally invasive surgery. This can never be drained by any form of percutaneous catheter. So if patient is deteriorating percutaneous catheter, not working, you may have to go for surgery. So my question to Dr. Gupta, and I would want a brief answer to Dr. Gupta, is what is the role of surgery as a single or additional procedure in this two to four weeks period, and which surgical procedure and when? So the indication of surgery would be the failure of sepsis reversal, and we generally use uh, 72 hours to seven days time period if there is no reversal we would think of uh, upsizing to uh, I mean, uh, going next step which is generally surgery and uh, we prefer minimal invasive than open necrosectomy because of the obvious advantages which we can discuss later what we have seen is that when we put percutaneous catheters most of these patients do have initial reversal of sepsis and they come into a stage of simmering sepsis and that is majority of our patients today after we have done. and these are the patients who continue with that simmering sepsis as you said it is an undefined territory but most of the patients would require intervention at that time another criteria is if the necrosum is more than 50 percent and these are the mainly outline of the indications the indication of direct surgery would be a collection which is retrogastric has been dealt with in the first step as endoscopy and not successful. We can do transgastric necrosectomy, which can be open or laparoscopy. In the one go, we can take, take care of the necrosum. The external pancreatic fistula can be avoided. And if it is a biliary etiology, that can also be taken care of. Other open other indications would be a patient who has intestinal ischemia or necrosis with fecal pyelinitis or uh, bleeding. In addition, as was uh, discussed in the first session, aggressive fluid resuscitation leading to abdominal compartment syndrome, especially if it is not treated by conservative measures like nasogastric tube, rectal tube, neuromuscular blockade, and then even hemofiltration. And these are the patients who will need decompressive laparostomy to take care of the abdominal compartment to prevent intestinal ischemia and renal respiratory failure. Uh, uh, Mahesh, can I just uh, make yes, a yes. I would like yes. to know from Dr. Rajesh that how many times do you go in 
without evidence of uh, a, you know a fistula or a, for bleeding in the first four weeks how often have you uh, been there because uh, you know we don't find that situation we deal with a lot of acute necrotizing pancreatitis we don't deal with that situation very often very rarely if we have a clear cut uh, bowel fistula or bleed then uh, which is not controlled by interventional radiology then only we uh, subject them to surgical intervention so i just wanted to explain. so i i, I agree completely so, sir that the uh, opportunities to go in two and four with, between two and four weeks are very few there is no doubt about and even if there is an opportunity we would like to tie it over to four weeks because once we have a, a necrosum which you know distinguishes between viable and unviable tissue the incidence of bleeding is less the incidence of organ failure is less and the post operative uh, complications are also fewer compared to when we go in early. so we try to go in but then if we have already placed a drain percutaneous and the patient is not responding then probably we would not wait longer and if there is no response within six or seven days we would like to go in to uh, necrosectomy so i think i would tend to agree with both randeer and dr rajesh that you try to avoid surgery as much as you can, but we are looking at that small subset of 20% of the people yeah. who are deteriorating very fast, and you really cannot allow them to die in this period. So you may go for a step-up approach, and I would like to quote these two studies, Penter study and German study, where they had two arms, one was step-up approach and direct surgical necrosectomy, and it was shown that step-up approach is always better. So you first try percutaneous catheter revenge, and uh, this step up approach just shows a lower complication, lower mortality, and possibly lower diabetes. And this has been shown even on a long term in a recent study published in gastroenterology from the Pentra trial that even on long term, this uh, step up approach is better. So, uh, step up approach is that you go for percutaneous catheterinis. If it fails, then you can go from the retroperitoneal route either with the directly or through the video endoscope. And it has been shown that the retroperitoneal pancreatic necrosectomy, if it is feasible as is possible in 70% of the cases is a lower complication rate. Let me now quickly move on to the last case, which is a 79 years old male hypertensive ischemic heart disease was admitted with us on 6th of uh, this month. He had pain abdomen for 18 days, was admitted somewhere else with a pancreatic type. This was the initial CT scan, severe intensity, fever, nausea, vomiting, was hospitalized elsewhere, definite diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, was treated with antibiotics. We uh, got this patient in this stage almost on day 23. We did a CT scan and an ultrasound, and CT scan showed an ill-formed wall. The wall was there, but it was 2.5 millimeter in thickness, and there was some necrosis on ultrasound. Ultrasound shows about 10 to 8 centimeter sized acute necrotic collection. So what we did in this case is that we did a uh, hot exios. Uh, this is exactly on 24 to 25 days, and this was a 10 centimeter into 9 centimeter collection with some debris. And you can see that we are placing the hot axios here. Uh, this was a 15 millimeter diameter hot axios. And to cut the long story short, uh, we on the on the first day itself did a small amount of necrotic tissue was removed. We repeated the procedure two times more at interval of two to three days, and you can see a necrotic tissue coming out. And uh, we use various instruments, biopsy forceps, polypectomy snare, and this is the end point after three sessions. So this is how the CT scan looks like after the extra stand has been placed. I must tell you, this is a very rare situation. We usually don't get a case uh, like this, that in third to fourth week. But so uh, my question to Dr. Jahir Nabi, if he's around, I have not seen him as yet. Sir, what I'm here, sir. Yes, okay, yeah. Zahir. So what is the status of endotherapy for collection in two to four weeks period? There is some changing paradigm, the new data which is coming up, coming up in the last one year. So can you summarize what is the status of endotherapy? Uh, sure, sir. Thank you, for your, thank you for your question. So first of all, uh, the four week time frame is an arbitrary, arbitrary time frame and it's, on, it's not an absolute time frame when encapsulation occurs. So we find patients who have encapsulated collections at three uh, to four weeks also. And we find patients who have this encapsulation of collections even after four to six weeks. So this time frame is not an absolute time frame. Encapsulation is uh, what is more important. So now we have four studies in all, uh, which have evaluated uh, uh, this uh, impact of uh, endoscopic drainage in early collections. That is between two to four weeks. Importantly, uh, we have whatever data we have is uh, is majority of them they have performed after three weeks of 
of drainage, which means that majority of them had at least partial encapsulation of their collection. So uh, the approach that we can utilize here is if the collection is encapsulated, there is, there is no problem. And if it is within the reach of endoscopic drainage, it's a centrally located collection and endoscopic drainage is visible. And I think uh, now is the time that we can attempt endoscopic drainage in these patients. Now there is a scenario when these collections are not encapsulated. We don't have uh, sufficient data and we don't have data to suggest that how much encapsulation is required before we can safely perform endoscopic uh, uh, transmural drainage. So there are a couple of studies which have performed endoscopic transmural drainage in highly selected group of patients where they have uh, performed this drainage in partially encapsulated collection and have found good results in all the patients. And more importantly, the most important worry is perforation in these cases if the collections are not well encapsulated. Interestingly, none of the studies, in fact, one of the studies uh, was performed by Professor Rajesh Gupta's unit and uh, and there was no perforation complication in any of these patients. So uh, definitely in a selected group of patients, endoscopic drainage can be performed. So for the thank you, Jahir, for the audience. I would just run through quickly in two minutes these studies with uh, Jahir talked about. So I must say that as Jahir said, most of these cases which have been done has been done in the fourth week. Hardly there is data on the second or the early third week. So they are towards the later part of the third week or the fourth week that endoscopic drainage has been done. Why we want to avoid endoscopic drainage usually in this period is because of the lack of well-formed walls, so the risk of perforation in hemoperitoneum, and because the necrosis is more solid. But as Jahid said, this four weeks is somewhat arbitrary, and this is an early intervention. That was the data published a few months back. So look at the picture. A very thin capsule is there, and uh, somewhat similar to the case which we presented, 49 cases in the series. Technical success was very high. Clinical success rate, 87%. Four necrosectomy on average. Adverse effects were seen in 12% of the patients. Now, this is a study, again published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, where there are two uh, sets of people, early endoscopy drainage but then st versus standard endoscopy drainage, total 193 patients. Indication quality drainage is what we discussed, similar complication rate between the early and the standard, similar improvement in organ failure, but the early cases had higher mortality, higher need for surgery, and longer hospital stay. So they were somewhat sicker patients possibly, and therefore these results were somewhat inferior to the standard therapy. Now there's another study which is compared early with versus late endoscopy drainage of necrotic collection. And look at the data. The main thing is that the length of hospital stay is more, more in early intervention cases. However, the new viruses formation is less in early endoscopic cases. So this is a study which uh, Zahid talked about from Dr. Gupta and Dr. Rana where they compared endoscopic versus packet drainage in the early ne pentatic necrosis. And look at the data, a significant number of patients. So time of two resolution. Look at this, PCD 61 days compared to endoscopic therapy 30 days. So PCD was inferior. Salvage surgery was required in much higher proportion of PCD than in endoscopic drainage. And external pentatic fistula was none in endoscopic drainage compared to 20% in PCD. So this, there, there is a role for endoscopy drainage in a subset of patients. This is the figures from their study, published in endoscopic ultrasound, plastic stents, and metal stents in early drainage. Of course, EUS is always preferred, and we would never do a two to four weeks drainage without EUS because of the obvious reasons that it identifies the debris in the collection, high technical success, avoids intervening blood vessels, and lower complications. So endotherapy in two to four weeks, there are un unresolved issues, selection of cases, timing of procedure, choice of state, stents, need for necrosectomy, technique of necrosectomy, and whether additional procedure, saline, hydrogen peroxide, uh, drain is required or not. These will remain unanswered because this is a changing paradigm over the recent time. Uh, if I have to compare PCD with endotherapy in early drainage, PCD can be done anytime, no need for wall maturity. Can be done for peripheral lesions, peripheral collections, and pelvic collections. Even if the patient is unstable, one can do a PCD. But there are problems of local site pain, external catheter, fistula. Whereas endotherapy has faster resolution, allows solid drainage, and decreased need of surgery. But there is possibly an increased risk of bleeding. Now, I will not discuss the disconnected pentatic duct syndrome because we hardly deal with them in the first two to four weeks, but there will be questions. Mostly, they will be managed by percutaneous drain in this period rather than going for. Uh, surgery or a more definitive prep. So if I have to summarize the presentation, my take home message, and Randhir has to agree with this, is that for peripheral collection between two to four weeks, a small proportion of patients need consideration for intervention. 
we will usually be very, very conservative in this. If you require intervention, percutaneous catheterization is usually a preferred modality. We can discuss the size, technique, and additional procedures, and this has been highlighted in the discussion today. Surgical approach is required as a step-up approach, and we usually prefer a minimal excess preferred uh, in the small subset of people who will undergo surgery. Uh, surgery. Endoscopic drainage is a changing paradigm can be offered not in the second week, but from third week onwards, if partial wall formation is taken place, metal stents are usually preferred over plastic, and the necrosectomy may be done as a side of approach. Thank you very much. Randeer, you have any comments to me? No, I think uh, I fully agree. I all, uh, my only take is that if we, uh, you know, we tend to delay the intervention, whether it is PCD or endoscopic, uh, you know, uh, if possible, if there's no evidence of sepsis and uh, go in uh, with PCD first. Uh, yes, and uh, endoscopic intervention is becoming more attractive because ultimately we don't need the capsule on the other side for drainage. That's what the concept is generated. So we if we are in the free peritoneum on the other side and it's a, just a collection, that's good enough. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, there is definitely high risk of bleeding. Can I make a quick comment, sir? Yes, Rajesh. Sir, I would like to add here that if PCT is being used for acute necrotic collection and not one, it should be only used for drainage, not for irrigation. Otherwise, it will lead to peritonitis. I agree. Okay. Can I, can I just make a comment, sir? Yes, yes sure. sir. Sir, I would say that there should be caution when, when uh, you know, trying to do endoscopic drainage in the third week onwards. So I think uh, very important to emphasize again, and I, I know that you have done that. Uh, when you showed that case of day 23, that a wall has to be formed because we have seen patients having undergone endoscopic therapy and developing peritonitis because then there's a leakage. And if it's a leakage of infected fluid, then you had it. So uh, my 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 only uh, caution here is that people who are doing, because nowadays everybody will say just put in a covered metal stand. I think that has to be done very, very carefully. I cannot overemphasize this point, uh, promote that uh, this particular patient, if you saw the CT scan, there was a wall which started forming and we measured it and it was almost throughout 2.5 millimeter was the thickness, so it was not very thick wall, but the wall has started forming and we thought that we were safe in that situation. But I totally agree that the message should be that endoscopic therapy should be taken with caution in this situation, should be done only in selected patients towards the fourth week maybe, but as Dr. Zahir said, this four week is somewhat arbitrary and some of these patients develop a wall even before that. Uh, so uh, Ravi, is there any questions on the chat box? Um, I think uh, there, there are questions, but we don't, I don't think we are uh, 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 time. So as we are running short of time, my suggestion, I was actually about to say that, uh, all the questions will be answered which are not addressed at this time later on by email. Uh, I assure all the delegates that I know there will be a lot of questions, unanswered queries, but we'll, uh, because to keep the discipline in place and to keep, stick to the I think it will be nice that if we uh, answer those questions later on. Yeah. I uh, promise you that. Well, uh, Mahesh and Randeep, thank you very much. And of course, thanks to all the panelists for making such a wonderful discussion, covering such a difficult topic in such a short time, giving the clear-cut carry-home messages. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I would like to make just one or two announcements. One is, of course, the, about the messages, that the uh, questions will be answered by email if they are not covered in the topic. And second, I just want to uh, make you update that there's a very good response to this um, meeting, we are number of people who have logged in is uh, almost reaching 700. And uh, uh, I mean, people are still joining, but which is a very actually much beyond all our expectations, what we had initially thought of. So that tells us the attraction of the people that who are the faculty and the subject, both uh, uh, which people are interested in listening. Uh, so I come back to this, we move on to the third uh, case capsule. With this, we move on from acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis. And the case capsule manage the complications of chronic pancreatitis. I like to reiterate what I said in the beginning that our aim of selection of topics in this was the ones, the topics which have some added literature uh, in the last two years or so. 
where we had contributed more at two, which had not been discussed or which were untouched in the earlier presentations. I mean, we have had frequent uh, meetings on the management of pain in chronic pancreatitis. So I talked to Nagi, says, let's leave the pain this side because this is one controversy which will not be sorted out in the next uh, 25 years as well because we'll, uh, surgeons and endoscopists will keep fighting on that. So uh, this case capsule on chronic pancreatitis and uh, the, both the people who are moderating that, I mean, it would be actually a, a shame on me to even introduce them because Nageshwar Reddy, well, uh, I don't need to, uh, from AIG Hyderabad, dear friend, the leader, and of course, who has contributed the maximum in the area of chronic pancreatitis from our country. And G. N. Ramesh, a dear friend, right from PGI and G. B. Pandes, and a great uh, gastroenterologist. Above all, those who don't know, he's a Malu, but he's a great Hindi uh, song, uh, uh, Hindi song uh, <laughs> player. So uh, he's an Astor in uh, uh, Kochi. And uh, over to you, Nagi and G. N. You can introduce the panelists and please go on to the next case. Uh, thank you, Ajay. So we will quickly start without taking too much time with introductions. Uh, Co-chairing the session with me is Jian uh, Ramesh, who's got huge experience with chronic pancreatitis uh, from Cochin. We have Dr. Sanjay Kumar from Bhopal, uh, Dr. Jayanta Samantha from uh, PGI Chandigarh, Dr. Mohan and Dr. G.B. Rao from AIG. So we'll start with the case. This is actually a common problem that we face in clinical practice. So we thought we'll take this uh, case, which uh, uh, would be discussed mostly by our panelists. And uh, what will uh, Ajay actually talked about complications of a problem that occurs in chronic pancreatitis. So I think we'll have to go to the starting of this uh, presentation. Yeah. So this was a very simple case that came to us, which is a common problem in clinical practice, and we'll try and. Uh, see what our panelists will do to help us out and of course gn will be adding his comments because of his experience so let me start with this this is a male 40 year old patient uh, was not an alcoholic or a smoker he presented with intermittent abdominal pain of seven months duration he had lost four kg in the last six months and last one and a half months he's developed a uh, progressive jaundice about a year ago, he had uh, detected hyperglycemia and was being treated for diabetes. This is one year. Uh, so there's no other history that was significant. So when he came to us, his, uh, this was in April of this year, his bilirubin levels were very high, 22. Uh, his alkaline phosphatase also was elevated. He had a previous investigation done elsewhere, and you can see there's a progressive increase in his uh, jaundice and a progressive deterioration in terms of uh, what is happening to the other functions. So we investigated him uh, routinely. The only positive finding at this stage, of course, was abnormal A1C, but a CA99, which was elevated 131. Our normal uh, value is up to 30. So this is about three times elevated. So this was a patient who had the chronic pancreatitis, history of chronic pancreatitis, recently detected diabetes, and elevated CA99. So at this stage, an ultrasound scan was done. Ultrasound showed features of chronic calcific pancreatitis, dilated pancreatic duct, interrectal calculi. There's a bulky pancreatic head with a tapering distal CBD, upstream dilatation, and central HPRD, mildly dilated CBD. So, in summary, up to now, what we have information is chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, pancreatic head mass, and elevated CA99. So what is the significance of CA99 in this situation? Does it mean that this patient has pancreatic malignancy? So I'll start by asking Sanjay uh, what his impressions are. At this stage, how much importance you would give to CA99? Sanjay? Sanjay is on the panel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. Please come on, Sanjay. Yeah. yeah. So can... uh, since the CA 19.9 is raised, but it is not uh, a very high level in malignancy. Generally, we expect uh, levels to be very high till 1000. And we very well know that it can be raised even in uh, cholangitis and any obstructive jaundice in cholidopolithiasis. So I don't think I will give much importance to this uh, level of CA 19.9. And uh, maybe we'll investigate this uh, patient uh, further. It could still be a benign uh, head mass leading oh. to obstruction of both uh, CBD and pancreatic duct. 
Okay. I think uh, very important. Uh, we should not give too much importance to CA99 because we know in some benign uh, situations, especially stone disease with cholangitis, we can see the highest levels. We have seen 10,000, 20,000. So this is again for OTIS practitioners. It's more often used uh, not for screening, but when you're following up patients who already had surgery, and then you see an elevated CA99 indicating. Uh, you agree with me, Sanjay? Yeah. yeah. Ramesh, you have any different experience with CA99? Ramesh, you have to unmute, unmute yourself. What uh, what what level of CA99 would prompt you to say that, okay, this is CA pancreas, I don't need to investigate more, and I'll send him straight to the surgeon, number one. That's the first question. Uh, and uh, second question is, uh, in your experience, do you think that CA99 has any pro prognostic value? Uh, the answer for both is no. Uh, in fact, uh, we'll ask other panelists to their opinion. The level of CA99 usually in the literature is more than 300 is suggestive. If you're 30 is normal. But again, we have seen very high levels with uh, benign disease whenever there's an obstruction. So simple fact is obstruction, you get anyway high elevated CA99. So I don't think it has got significance in that sense. Even very high levels don't indicate metastasis or anything like that. So I think these levels are not so important. Anybody else has an opinion on this in the panel? Yeah, I think I would get, get, ask Jimmy Rao for his opinion. Would would he take up a patient with a level of more than three hundred straight away for surgery without any any further investigations? Yeah, Ramesh, actually, this patient actually the only thing the relatively younger patient presented uh, with recent onset uh, diabetes uh, and obstruction. The CA ninety nine. Maybe I'll just I don't think because he's got. Jaundice, which is almost about 20 plus, I think it may not be that very significant, uh, but I think we need to further evaluate, maybe mostly in favor of malignancy in this patient. Uh, but certainly, uh, I think we'll have to do uh, further evaluation for this patient before we can uh, time the surgery for this patient. So, I think CA99 general doesn't seem to be a very good parameter, although. Uh, it's used often. Another interesting thing that happened in this patient, uh, and I like Jayanta's comment on this, is that a year back, he was detected to have diabetes. And we know this association between diabetes and pancreatic cancer. So what uh, are your impressions on that? Because one year back, diabetes was detected, and it's being treated for that. Jayanta? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for the question. This is a very interesting uh, topic is that uh, patient is already having chronic pancreatitis, then having a new onset diabetes within the last one year, and then uh, the patient is having a pancreatic head mass. So this study by, uh, I would like to highlight this study by Dr. Chari's group uh, published in Gastronary 2018, where they showed that if there is a, a diabetes, uh, that patients who had pancreatic adenocarcinoma, 36 months prior to that diagnosis, patients started developing hyperglycemia. And in fact, full blown diabetes was seen in around 6 to 12 months prior to the diagnosis of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So, coming to this case, definitely, since the patient has developed a malignancy one year back, so definitely the risk or the chances of a pancreatic malignancy in this patient will be high. One more point I'd like to highlight is that both uh, diabetes, a patient who develops a type 2 diabetes with a duration of less than one year has a risk of five-fold increased risk of developing pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So this patient has both chronic pancreatitis as well as uh, a recent onset diabetes. So one study from population-based study from Taiwan showed that the hazard ratio was 33-fold increased risk of ductal adeno pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma in this particular scenario. Definitely, the, the risk of uh, malignancy will be high in this case as, as they has a recent onset diabetes. Yeah. yeah. So, in this, this was a situation where they just looked at pancreatic cancer, but not in the setting of chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. So, is there any difference, do you think, that uh, because can you just apply this study just to all patients with chronic pancreatitis? Because we know that in chronic pancreatitis, they already have type 3 uh, diabetes. Yes, sir. I'll reiterate the fact that that is in the presence of chronic pancreatitis with diabetes, definitely the risk increases much more than as compared to the to this particular study of a general population. So, uh, or other than the Taiwan study showed a very high risk of 30, but other studies have shown at least 5 to 12 times increased risk of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma when we are dealing with chronic pancreatitis and diabetes together. Yeah. As yes, compared sir. to just diabetes. Yeah. So, that's a very good point that uh, risk of carcinoma increases by about 15 times 
when you have uh, independent pancreatitis with and we also have more i can see coming on is not a pancreatitis but maybe want to make a point here yeah yeah just wanted to make a point suresh tari used to say that in anybody with diabetes coming above 60 years of age you should rule out pancreatic carcinoma uh, so just look for it. why should an elderly onset person develop uh, diabetes suddenly out of the blue after 60 but i have looked at a large series of my patients above 60 and that the reverse what i just now said is not really true you can have late onset diabetes and nothing to do with pancreatic cancer but the other way around when you said the both occurring almost together one year duration diabetes one year duration that's very strongly indicative i thought i'll just make that point so you can have late onset diabetes just type 2 diabetes coming in the elderly in fact we have a new subtype now we call it as mild age related diabetes or mard it's actually a subtype of type 2 diabetes it has nothing to do with uh, chronic pancreatitis or with cancer just thought i'll just say that. thank you thank you my lord is tempting if you have mohan there even if he's not on the panel tempting to do diabetes to get him on thank you for that stuff thank you okay so we will go to the next so this patient uh, we are still not very sure there's a mass there's elevated the cnna diabetes of beta something so our thinking is going more towards a potential chance of a malignancy in this patient with chronic pancreatitis so we went into imaging more advanced imaging and of course we did a ct pancreatic protocol ct uh, this showed uh, again i won't go into the details but this showed a hypoenhancing head mass of 3.5 cm just abutting the sma this displays the calcification and there was a significant double duct sign so we then went ahead further and did an mr of course we are very fond of mr cps as uh, endoscopies so mr cp showed very clearly this very dilated pancreatic duct uh, a thinned out uh, terminal part of cbd is dilated beyond the so, so called double duct sign So this was present, and of course, the T2 images showed a heterogeneous head mass, uh, which seemed to show a cutoff of MPD. Again, it's a double duct sign. Uh, so we, at this stage, what happens is we don't have a radiologist in this group, but we'll we'll ask Mohan to act as a radiologist and tell us what is the role of CT and MR because we want to make it very simple. The radiologists make it very complicated, and sometimes don't understand. So Mohan, can you make it very simple for us? And yeah. as a clinician, how what how what did you look at in this patient? Okay, so that's a very important question. And as a clinician, we are well trained for CT, but not for MR. Uh, but there are other reason for choosing CT over MR in this patient is now we have a clinical condition of a progressive jaundice with a patient presenting as head mass. So obvious question in our mind is whether we are dealing with an inflammatory mass or there is a. a Super added malignancy which has developed on this chronic pancreatitis patient. So obviously we'll do a, a first test which we did is a pancreatic protocol CT scan. Now, what is this pancreatic protocol CT? It is nothing but uh, taking the CT image, CT image in dual phase. What is dual? give contrast 35 seconds that is known as late arterial when pancreas start enhancing now there is a mass which is suspected to be cancer and we know that cancer mass are hypoattenuating so there will be a good differentiation between a mass and a normal pancreas so always evaluate pancreas in a phase where pancreatic gland is now enhancing that is late arterial phase the second And why it is known as dual? See the another image in portal phase. Now, what is portal phase? Portal phase starts after 70 seconds. Now, in this phase, we'll see for secondaries. We'll see the liver better. We'll see the portal vein better. So, uh, if we have a very good a uh, dual phase that is known as pancreatic protocol, uh, we can make a lot of uh, studies. Now, what are those studies? unfortunately the mass per se will look same like that will look hypoattenuating on ct not only the malignant mass but also inflammatory mass sometimes you may find double duct sign sometimes you find uh, ductal strictures involving both cbd and pd because pancreas can affect uh, uh, bile duct also in chronic pancreatitis we can find arterial encasement especially once you are dealing with autoimmune pancreatitis or there can be venous obstruction so 
a primary imaging of mass sometimes may not give us clue so we have to see for secondary imaging now what are those secondary imaging which can tell us whether we are dealing with inflammation or malignancy so those which are uh, they will point towards malignancy are even you see a duct more carefully there is a abrupt intervention of a duct that means there can be a malignancy moreover in a malignant disease the duct dilates very quickly and there is atrophy of the gland so duct will be more dilated pancreatic parenchyma will be less that is reverse in happens in chronic pancreatitis where duct will be less dilated and atrophy will be less so if whole of the pancreas is occupied by a dilated duct you should start suspecting malignancy and you should always see the mass where is the pancreas duct and if you can deal up within the mass that is known as duct penetrating site and that virtually rules out malignancy that is why a secondary imaging in a ct is important rather than seeing the mass in this case also we saw pancreatic calcification and if pancreatic calcifications are pushed to the periphery that means a malignancy is developing in center which is pushing the pancreatic calcification away or if you can see a artery which is getting encased that means your malignancy is developing so there are certain features which may tell us uh, about malignancy versus benign uh, on ct mr will be uh, a secondary imaging rather than the primary imaging i will use it when i want problem solving what are those problem solving if i see a focal ductal dilatation but i don't see a mass think mr can be a better choice to delineate a smaller mass or if i want to see a duct penetrating sign in a much better way i will use mrcp especially secreting uh, uh, you know uh, augmented mrcp rather than plain mrcp so mr is a second choice a good pancreatic protocol is the first choice in this okay case. thanks mon so i think these are very important points to emphasize to so this patient had both imaging done but normally in practice we don't have the luxury of getting both the things so if you had a choice in pancreatic mass with chronic pancreatitis your choice would be a pancreatic protocol ct right yes okay thank you so i think this is the important message that we get to the audience that if they had to do one investigation get a pancreatic protocol ct that will give you enough information especially all the points that mohan told you about displacement of calcification uh, duct penetrating sign are two very important signs and engagement of uh, the vessels but what about autoimmune pancreatitis we didn't get this into this uh, equation at all could this be patient yeah. having chronic pancreatitis yeah. autoimmune pancreatitis see uh, autoimmune pancreatitis the two very important features are that they do not have calcification in this patient which has started with calcification is very very uncommon a young patient uh, usually yes. we find yes. autoimmune pancreatitis in a male of uh, above 60 though there are different type 2 autoimmune can also occur in young patient but in this patient if we we also have to see what is happening to the proximal duct if okay. pd structure is there and there is non dilated duct that is autoimmune and if there is a massive dilatation beyond that is uh, not autoimmune because autoimmune is a sclerosing pancreatitis it's like a psc it will not allow duct to dilate even if there is obstruction thank you mon so good point autoimmune you find diffuse involvement a mass plus a duct which is not dilated okay so Uh, the next option in our patient, uh, because we seem to be fairly sure we're reaching malignancy here. Does PET scan have a role? Again, we'll ask Sanjay because this is something that is order, often ordered in private practice, but somehow literature seems to be different. Sanjay, do you think PET scan has any role in this patient? Should we do this? It seems that the PET uh, would be uh, a, a common next choice, but unfortunately, PET does not help in such patient because. Uh, Uh, even inflammation uh, will pick up uh, the contrast so uh, generally it is difficult to differentiate uh, between uh, a malignant uh, mass versus a inflammatory mass especially more so in pancreas because uh, this is a head mass and in unsenate process is a place where otherwise also uh, there is a concentration of uh, radio tracer uh, so it will confuse the issue more so i, I don't think uh, it is going to help 
So you're absolutely right. I think pet has doesn't have such of a role. Many reasons. One is low sensitivity specificity in this situation, and second, we know that transient uh, process itself can take up a very bright spot sometimes, giving a wrong expression. So as when a tumor is situated here, pet doesn't have. So we didn't do a pet actually, but we went into more uh, definitive diagnosis. As, well. as I think the first thing that we do as a uh, gastroenterologist now is to quickly go for endoscopic ultrasound. So we had this patient uh, endoscopic ultrasound was done. It was diagnosed very neoplastic dilated CBD. They were parenchyma interductal calicle, and we did an ultrasound guided FNB. And ultrasound guided FNB repeatedly done showed benign pancreatic tissue which is negative for malignancy. So here is a problem. Everything else is pointing to malignancy. But endoscopic ultrasound is suggestive of a benign lesion. So we're not, this is again a very common problem we see in clinical practice. Many times when you use an FNA and not FNB, the pathologist has come back, especially in chronic pancreatitis, saying not enough tissue. But here we need FNB, and uh, you can see the US pictures here showing a markedly dilated CBD and of course uh, abrupt narrowing. We did an elastography also, and you can see elastography very blue lesion here. Blue indicates heart, indicates malignancy. So macroscopically suggested malignancy, but unfortunately when we did biopsy, our pathologist uh, was very vehement that it's only benign cells that you're seeing, no malignancy. In fact, we called her once, the second time we did, we called her into the endoscopy room, did a rose, and even then she said, no, there's no malignancy. So I think this is an important area to discuss for a few minutes. So we'll ask uh, Jayanta here, who has considerable experience in this area, what is the role of US, either contrast or elastography, and what is the role of FNA or FNB? So this is how you have to clarify all your all the audience doubts here. Thank you, sir, for the question. This is a very interesting point. Uh, first, I'll go with US elastography. So when we talk about uh, uh, when we talk, uh, okay, sir. So we'll talk about US elastography. So for isolated pancreatic masses, US, US elastography has a good sensitivity specificity. Multiple people, both Dr. Mark Giovannini's group and Dr. Igle uh, Garcia Iglesias' group, have shown that the sensitivity specificity range is around 90-91. But when we talk about the chronic pancreatitis and a mass or an inflammatory mass developing the backdrop of a chronic pancreatitis, then the specificity of US elastography goes down. So what happens is because uh, there are multiple confounding factors, already there is a fibrotic pancreas. On top of that, if there is calcification, as Sir had shown in this case, that there was, if we can see that uh, image, that there was a calcification seen within that window of that uh, elastography image that we had. So these situations where there is calcification, that will have a confounding factor and give a falsely high uh, kind of US elastography showing blue and the strain ratio also tends to be high. So studies have shown that US elastography in the backdrop trying to differentiate between pseudo tumor and uh, So we lost your voice, sir. Yes, Hello? we lost your yes. voice. Yeah, can you sir, get Yeah, now now we have so US elastography, uh, the specificity drops if we have a chronic pancreatitis at the backdrop. In these situations, people have studied that if they use contrast enhanced US over and above the US elastography, then the specificity increases to as high as 95%. In fact, I'd like to highlight there is one very good paper from Christopher Dietrich group published in US Journal 2018. And they showed that US elastography had a specificity of just 38%. But when it was uh, CUS was used, the specificity increases and the accuracy goes to more than 90 percent now i'll come to the point of fna versus fnb I think, so I think this is a very important point we want to emphasize to the audience gastroenterology is doing us in a patient that is with a pancreatic mass kindly don't do us elastography it's a waste of time because like in this case you see it was very strongly positive it's not going to give us any further information so kindly don't do it okay what do you think about fna versus fnb uh, so uh, yes, sir. So here F we have two two things. One is whether FNA or FNB, and we have a backdrop of chronic pancreatitis. So uh, study one of the classical study from Dr. Sham group had shown way back in 2005. He had shown that if there is chronic pancreatitis in the backdrop, then the sensitivity dips by 17 percent. That is 91 percent, 74 percent. So after that, if we look into look back into the last five years, there are multiple randomized control trials, and even this, uh, as Sir has shown, the meta-analysis of randomized control trial has shown that FNB is definitely superior in terms of the specimen adequacy, the accuracy, as well as less need of needle biopsy. So definitely FNB uh, 
scores over f and a as far as the uh, adequacy of the uh, tissue and the diagnosis is concerned and there is one very good study published last year from italy they exactly address this uh, this issue of they studied on chronic pancreatic between pseudo tumor versus uh, uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma and they found that fnb increases the sensitivity by 17% over and above fna when we are using fnb and what needle would you use jenta you have two needles 20 or 25 gauge what would we use so for pancreatic uh, masses definitely we prefer a 20 gauge fna, uh, FNA needle and uh, sometimes we uh, nowadays 22 gauge fnb biopsy needles are also available so we can also use that 22 gauge Good. biopsy needle or a... so i think again two important messages don't do fna do fnb because you want uh, histology you want to distinguish autoimmune from pancreatitis you want to do molecular markers so stop doing fna do only fnb second important message is that if you have different needles uh, for pancreas use 20 gauge for fnb for lymph nodes you can use 25 gauge okay Maggie, GN, GN is raising his hand. Yeah, GN. Uh, just, uh, just, just a question to Jayant. Uh, uh, do you find it difficult to get a good window of uh, visibility? Because very often you find that there's a lot of calcification around. So, so how do you decide which area to target? Absolutely, sir. So that is what is. Uh, if we are using a plain B mode US uh, imaging. then the problem arises that there if there is a lot of calcification we exactly do not know where the exact lesion uh, is appearing and where to target to exactly get the best yield in those situations probably additional imaging technologies such as cus will probably help in kind of uh, guided biopsy from the area where we are kind of getting a hypoechoic kind of enhancement on the cus so probably that will help us in uh, targeting the suspicious okay thank you Yeah, so we'll quickly go because we have only two or three minutes left, and we have a surgical colleague also to get involved. This patient had obstructive uh, joint because of biliary strictures. Bilirubin was going to 30 milligrams by the time we saw him, so we had to quickly relieve the obstruction first before we end. So we put in a completely covered self-expanding metal stent and a plastic stent in between so that his joint would come down. So at this point of time, um, we ask Mohan because he's he's published this very recent study in gastroenterology. Mon, was this choice right, or do you think we have put in multiple plastic stents? Well, uh, this situation is totally different from what we published. Here, the problem is that patient has mass, and the uh, idea is to do preoperative biliary drainage because we are planning a surgery here because we know that the stenting does not work when there is a mass lesion, when there is a dense calcification. when there is a long uh, stricture but here the pr problem is uh, the uh, uh, to relieve the jaundice improve the nutrition and make him fit for surgery because the preliminary investigation have not suggested any uh, inoperability criteria yeah. so in but rather than talking about our paper that was the paper based on uh, if you want to improve the stricture if you want to resolute the stricture right, right, right. but the point is In this case, if you have chronic pancreatic stricture, the neoadjuvant therapy we use. So in this situation, very unusual. Not many people would do a preoperative stenting to reduce jaundice before surgery. We'll ask GB also about that. But was your preference plastic or a metal stent? What would you? Uh, in this situation, I, I, there is no data to back. But um, I will prefer a metal stent because it's a one time and it it reduces the jaundice quickly. We do not have. Yeah. It's quite effective. Bill Rubin came down quite dramatically with this. Uh, so again, again we have uh, some surgeons here. But Jivi, uh, would you have operated this patient without even uh, the jaundice is coming down directly? Because a lot of controversy. In, so it's not. You are suppose we are dealing with a pancreatic uh, malignancy and a high Bill Rubin. We know that maybe relief of obstruction is better. But this is chronic pancreatitis is a must. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, Nagi. Thank you so much, Nagi. So now, basically, we know that this is a patient with chronic pancreatitis with superimposed or mass lesion with obstructive jaundice crossing 30 plus. So, I think the preoperative biliary drainage would be an indication in this patient. Uh, but as per the cross-sectional imaging and the endoscopic ultrasound imaging, it looks like a resectable lesion. Uh, and uh, by doing an FNA and FNB in this patient, I don't think we can alter the. Management because there's hardly any data of uh, preoperative neoadjuvant therapy in patients with chronic pancreatitis with superimposed malignancy. The only thing is it is ruled out uh, malignancy. So this 
patient, I think we would uh, straight away take him for surgery. Yeah. So I think this is an interesting question. We actually have some other surgeons. I, I saw Silesh also joining in. GN, I remember HMA saying, why do you want to do all these procedures? Head mask, why don't you go and operate in this patient? So we have a patient with chronic calcific pancreatitis. We have a head mask, we are not sure inflammatory neoplastic. We have a CBD narrowing which has to be relieved. So why do all this? Why not directly go and do surgery? GN, I think, uh, uh, Precisely, that was what was going through my mind also. Yeah, because yeah. you are the... Uh, you're following uh, Ramesh's line of thinking. And uh, I, 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 was, uh, I, I was wondering, like, you, you, you do an FNA, it is negative, FNA, B, it is negative, but still at the back of your mind, you're, you're, the first the question that keeps coming up is, am I missing a malignancy? Am I missing a malignancy? That's why in the very beginning I asked GV, would you take him up straight away for surgery without going in for, for any of these? Yeah. I think, I think he gave the answer. But Ramesh, yeah. can you make a comment? Yeah. Who, who is that? Adarsh. Adarsh. Uh, Adarsh. Adarsh is very dark. You yeah. can't see you. Can yeah, you yeah. Can yourself somehow? Can't see you. Can't, can't the, see you. The, 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 comment will put, the comment will put light on the subject. So, no, we want it to be also bright because yeah, normally the, my, very bright. My, my question always is this, that we should do an investigation if it alters management, not to satisfy curiosity. So, if any investigation is going to alter management, like in this patient, we were just trying to satisfy our curiosity if it's a resectable lesion that GV said ultimately is going to land up in surgery. That's what I meant. So, and you're right. That's the reason I brought up this controversy. As I think for a gastroenterologist, there are a lot of messages here. As a gastroenterologist, we see a head mask. The first reaction would be to do an US FNA and get a diagnosis. The only reason I can justify as a gastroenterologist is that. Is there a rare possibility of an autoimmune? All the everything else is against it that we are missing. That could potentially, or maybe we were discussing further a new endocrine coming in later. So is it something else that we are missing? But what I don't fault with is that if you so easy now to do an US FNB, the patient, the cost is not a factor. Complication is not a factor. I think we can really discuss this, and there has to be some good studies which are going to explore this possibility. We don't have time to discuss too much of that, but I think this is a very interesting controversial point that we should do. And uh, of course, the role of surgery partly we discussed and what was uh, done in this patient, uh, what surgical management was planned with the phrase procedure with the pancreatic and hepatic genostomy. Can GB comment on this? Uh, now no, no. The this patient, I can see basically this, uh, this patient we have two types of procedures. Either we have a duodenal preserving procedures or uh, head resections actually. Preserving the uh, head resections for duodenal uh, narrowing. But in this case, patient actually, this patient actually underwent a Whipple's procedure actually. Now we had a, a mass patient which was more in favor of malignancy. So this patient, I think, uh, receptive lesion, I think, should go for a uh, Whipple's procedure. Okay. So thank you, so I just because we're short of time, I'll summarize what happened. In this patient, uh, your fries was actually done. Uh, so yeah, uh, frozen section was done. It was negative for malignancy, and uh, repeated uh, sections were taken, all negative for malignancy. He and postoperatively he has very well. Uh, so he ultimately turned out to be a benign pancreatic inflammatory mass in a situation where scientists was malignancy and others were. Uh, not and of course, uh, I think this typically shows the difficulty we have with the pancreatic head mass, uh, where you can't distinguish, especially in setting pancreatitis. So, I think I think we're coming to the end of this. Uh, I think we don't have too much time here. You know, there are many interesting questions that would pop up, uh, at this situation. Uh, we'll answer them later by individual emails. Okay, okay, we'll do that. So, again, thank you for giving us the opportunity to discuss this very um, common situation. Actually, I uh, again, I thank you. Actually, thank you I didn't think an interesting discussion was going on, so I didn't have the guts to uh, stop going between. But it was uh, wonderful. Carry home messages. John went well, very well. The right points have been made. And I went the most distinguished faculty from the country, all over the country is there. So, obviously, the message is uh, very clear. And I'm sure that it will help us, uh, all the delegates, to improve their management of these patients. Uh, to update that we have already have uh, uh, almost 900 delegates logged in, live delegates, which are already there. So every uh, half an hour, the numbers is increasing. But we go into the next um, the session on <coughs> pancreatitis. 
we go to the next session and my pleasant duty to uh, invite the next uh, uh, chairman uh, for the next uh, uh, lecture, Dr. Philips Augustine. Well, Philips, there's nobody practicing gastroenterology in this country and we have the remotest interest in pancreas who doesn't know Philips. Philips, I mean, uh, my senior resident at uh, PGI Chandigarh and uh, when he was doing DM, I was joined as MD. And of course, later on, he became an institution in himself when he set up the center, advanced center in uh, Kochi. And of course, um, how he actually nourished uh, pancreatology as an endoscopic specialty, we all know that. Uh, I'll pass it on to uh, uh, Philips to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Neha Berry, who will be uh, talking about pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Yes, uh, over to Philips. Thank you, Ajay, for uh, calling me to be part of this wonderful meeting. In fact, there's nothing much to introduce Dr. Neha Bari. She's uh, part of the organization. And uh, along with uh, you, she has done a wonderful job. And as I hear about 1,000 uh, delegates are watching it, so we don't want to waste time. She's a uh, uh, consultant, uh, gastroenterologist in your own hospital, BL Kapoor. Uh, welcome, Dr. Neha. Please. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, faculty. I'll be presenting a talk on pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and its management. So coming to the definition of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, it is a decrease in the pancreatic enzyme activity to a level which is unable to maintain the normal digestion. The most important enzyme here is lipase and therefore the most significant problem being fat mild digestion and steatoria. So why is this? This is because pan lipase has major secretion from the pancreas and minimal extra pancreatic production. As well, 99% of the lipase gets inactivated by gastric acid and luminal trypsin and chymotrypsin. Therefore, majority of the patients present with fat, mild digestion and steatoria. A short diagram regarding the pancreatic enzyme secretion. We know about the three phases of enzyme secretion. Here, the intestinal phase is the most important when chyme exits the stomach and enters into the duodenum. And this causes release of the major pancreatic hormones, that is cholecystokinin, which causes release of enzymes and proenzymes, and secretin, which adds to the major bulk of the pancreatic juice by secretion of water and bicarbonate. So therefore, if we see here, there is any pathology which affects the pancreatic parenchyma, the secretion of the enzymes, or the intestinal phase of stimulation of the pancreas can result in exocrine insufficiency. So therefore, the most important causes are decrease in the secretion, which is chronic pancreatitis, post-acute necrotizing pancreatitis and cystic fibrosis, as well as obstruction to the release of enzymes, which may be seen when the patient has a stricture or a tumor, and an impaired mixing where the patient has undergone a prior surgery which has altered the anatomy and there is an impaired mixing of the duodenal chyme with the pancreatic juices. Similarly, as I said, a decrease in the intestinal stimulation due to any of the small bowel malabsorptive disorders like celiac disease and Crohn's can also result in PI as well as an increase in the gastric acidity as seen in Zollinger-Ellison syndrome which can cause early inactivation of the pancreatic enzymes. Severe pancreatic exocrine insufficiency usually occurs when the lipase content decreases to less than 10% of normal. So this is the stage at which the stool fat starts increasing to more than 7 grams, which is defined as steatoria. The burden of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency in patients with chronic pancreatitis, it has been seen that all across the studies from North India, South India, East India, as well as the West, up to 34% patients with early onset and 53% patients with late onset CP will eventually develop PEI in the course of their disease. It is also seen after an acute pancreatitis episode in up to 62% of the patients more in alcoholic, severe and necrotizing pancreatitis. At follow-up of up to 5 years, 35% patients may actually continue to have exocrine insufficiency more in those with severe as compared to mild and may require PERT on follow-up. Severe exocrine insufficiency is defined as a lipase secretion of less than 10%, steatoria with a quantitative fecal fat more than 7, positive sudan staining, fecal elastase which is the most important test that I will come to as less than 100 microgram per gram of stool and a positive uh, carbon <laughs> 
13 mixed triglyceride breath test. Severe PI can be a symptomatic overt insufficiency where the patient has overt steatoria, maldigestion, weight loss and a poor quality of life and these are clear-cut indications for starting pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy or it may be an asymptomatic occult disease where the fecal fat is between 7 to 15, patient is asymptomatic, has micronutrient deficiency but these patients are at an increased risk of cardiovascular risk and osteoporosis and hence are now becoming candidates for starting PERT. Coming to the diagnosis, earlier we had the most sensitive test of direct pancreatic function tests which are now used only for research purposes and it is the indirect PFTs which are more commonly used in present scenario. So the direct pancreatic function test used to measure the amount of bicarbonate and enzymes which are released after injection with secretin cholecystokinin. This was considered as a gold standard, but these tests were not standardized, it had limited availability, was cumbersome with difficult tube placement and therefore is now used only in research purposes at tertiary care centers. More important are the indirect pancreatic function tests. Here, the most important test which was 72 hour fecal fat collection where the patient had to be on a 100 gram per day fat diet for 5 days. A 3 day stool sample was collected and that measured the exact amount of steatoria. As we realized, keeping the patient on a 100 gram per day diet was difficult. The stool sampling collection was uncomfortable for the patient as well as for the lab personnel. And hence, this test is slowly passing out and is being only used at tertiary centers for research purposes. As an alternative came the quantitative <clears throat> stool fat testing by using sudan staining and acid steatocrit, but they had a very poor sensitivity and specificity and are now being considered just as a crude screening test and not as a replacement of fat collection. So the more important tests which are widely available and used is fecal elastase. Also in some countries the breath test is being used particularly in Europe and Australia but not available in India. So what are the advantages of fecal elastase? It's a single spot stool sample testing. It is an ELISA test. The fecal concentration is five times higher than the concentration in the blood. It is not affected by dietary fat, not affected by oral PERT, and has a 100% sensitivity in patients with moderate to severe PE. So therefore, this is the test which is commonly used to diagnose PE in the current scenario. The only caveat is that it should not be used on a stool specimen which is which is when the patient is having diarrhea because it has a false positivity of 38% in the presence of diarrhea. The C triglyceride breath test where the patient is giving a C13 labeled substrate which is digested by the pancreatic enzymes. Further, these substrates are digested in the liver and the CO2 can be exhaled in the breath and tested. This also has a very good sensitivity and specificity. The major advantage is that you can detect the, the compliance and the efficacy of PERT with this test. However, it is not currently available in our country. Other uh, possible conditions which can predispose to PE are the ones which are seen on pancreatic morphology like calcifications and MPD dilatation. Patients' symptoms and signs are usually a late presentation like diarrhea, steatoria, flatulence and have a very poor reliability as they are subjected, affected by diet and opioid-based painkillers and patient may have similar symptoms in other GI disorders. Therefore, in the Indian scenario, if a patient has a high likelihood setting with a pancreatic morphology on CT, MR, CP or US suggesting a chronic pancreatitis or any other parenchymal disease and the patient has symptoms and signs of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, it becomes a case for starting PERT. Short of that, if needs testing, fecal fat is very cumbersome as only limited to tertiary centers and therefore fecal elastase is the test of choice which can be carried out widely at most of the centers for detecting pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. So why give PERT to these patients? There are a lot of studies, most of them are short-term studies where PERT has been compared to no therapy or to placebo in patients with exocrine insufficiency. Most of these studies have shown a significant benefit on coefficient of fat absorption, nitrogen absorption and fecal fat absorption as compared to placebo as we can see on this forest chart when most of the studies are showing are favoring PERT. Apart from this, there are two open label extensions up to one year. One of them are from India itself which have shown a significant improvement in nutritional, param nutritional parameters, weight, GI symptoms and quality of life on patients on PERT. So how do we do PEI? When to start? 
as i have mentioned that symptomatic severe exocrine insufficiency or a fecal fat from more than 15 g per day is a clear cut indication for starting pert however pert should also be considered in patients with subclinical severe pi to correct their subclinical malnutrition as this has an increased risk of premature atherosclerosis osteoporosis and cardiovascular events and this is being endorsed by all the societies at present when the patient is on pert we have to ensure that there is no fat restriction the patient has to be on a normal diet with an adequate pert ensure a healthy lifestyle modifications with smoking cessation and alcohol cessation and vitamin supplementation is to be given if the patient continues to be deficient despite an adequate pert the preparations available are mainly pancreatolipase which are porcine concentrated extract the available preparations are enteric coated micro micro tablets micro beads microspheres mini microspheres non enteric coated tablets and now even granules are available so what is an ideal pert preparation the one which has a high enzyme content stable in a long shelf life is acid resistant and enteric coated well mixed and distributed with chyme in the stomach the particle size ranges between 0.8 to 1.2 and has a fast liberation at the duodenal ph of 5 to 5.6 so start with an initial dose of 25000 to 40000 units of lipase for the major meals and add 10 to 25000 for snacks this can be titrated up to 75000 to 80000 units of lipase per meal at this dosage also the digestion may not be normal is normalized in only about 60% of the cases so what are the barriers to effective pert i will just come to on the next slide administer pert with meals with the first bite and add extra enzymes during or towards the end of the meal so coming to starting with a high dose versus a low dose pert there have been studies which have compared the two and have found that though a high dose pert shows a slightly better response to coefficient of fat absorption and fat excretion this is not significant so therefore start with low dose and titrate according to the clinical response in periodic nutritional assessment rather than adding to the cost and the capsule burden of the patient by starting with a high dose coming to enteric coated versus non enteric coated all the studies have shown a significant difference with respect to enteric coated preparations and hence these are currently recommended so what are the barriers to effective pert first and foremost is a gastric acid barrier that is a gastric acid which is digesting the enzymes before they are able to reach the duodenum second is a rapid gastric emptying then an inadequate mixing and separation of the enzymes from the duodenal chyme a low duodenal ph which can occur because of a poor pancreatic secretion of bicarbonate and delayed dissolution of enteric coated enzyme microspheres where they may actually be releasing the enzyme low down into the jejunum so what are the ways to overcome <coughs> this use enteric coating that is natural or synthetic polymers can add acid suppression with ppis particle size should be ideal that is 1.4 plus minus 0.3 and you can try adding non enteric coated enzyme to the beginning of the meal collateral damage in the form of micronutrient deficiencies and deficiencies of fat soluble vitamins should also be addressed at the time of diagnosis and then yearly thereafter there is a 60% prevalence of osteopenia and osteoporosis in these patients and hence serial bone mineral density scans should also be considered to assess the response see for the weight gain improvement in diarrhea steatorrhea stool test like sudan 3 may be used coefficient of fat absorption cna fecal fecal fat excretion are all mainly for research purposes breath test is not available what is important to note here is that fe1 is useful for diagnosis but not for assessing the response as it is not affected by pert assess for fat soluble vitamins so coming to the conclusion whenever we diagnose a patient with severe pancreatic insufficiency start with an adequate dose of pert ensure lifestyle modification a healthy diet with no fat restriction and assess the response at 3 to 6 months with clinical symptoms nutritional assessment and stool fat if the patient shows a good response reinforce the importance of daily dosing and periodic assessment for an inadequate response check compliance fecal chymotrypsin may be used in this condition correct the dose and timing if not then go on to increase the dose of lipase where double the dose may be used add ppi consider trial of ppi with an uncoated enzyme at the start of the meal rule out other causes particularly sibo giardias celiac disease malignancy or ibs consider a two week trial of antibiotics for sibo with rifaximin or metrogen 
work up for a small bowel disease or try switching the formulation coming to just a small point of safety should know that it is an ex excellent and a safe therapy with adverse effects similar to placebo do not chew it fibrosing colonopathy which was initially found in patients of cystic fibrosis using a high dose was mainly addressed due to acid resistant coating and is not seen in the current times there is a theoretical risk of zoonotic viral infection however they are not reported there are certain future developments which are still going on but none of them are approved at present which may help to improve the efficiency of pert these are supplementation of duodenal bicarbonate recombinant lipase microbial lipases a uh, new delivery systems with bacterial engineering and structuring the dietary lipids so coming to my summary pert is effective in exocrine insufficiency our aim is to ensure a normal diet with a normal fat content start with an adequate dose monitor response enteric coated preparations with high lipase and mini microspheres are preferred ppis are not mandatory with enteric coated preparations but they may increase response in suboptimal responses sibo should be looked for and treated if patient is still not responding assess for the collateral damage and replace the losses thank you uh, thank you dr mari uh, for an excellent for coverage to finish we can have 3 minutes for discussion hmm? yeah uh, i would just uh, uh, like to raise two uh, <coughs> practical questions we may uh, look absurd actually uh, one is uh, because of the high cost there is a problem of compliance in our patients actually i'm i'm sure everybody has seen that so you have been talking about low dose and then going on for uh, higher dose service there an optimum level at which you could say okay this may be sufficient any any test or anything in general practice we can advise sir in general practice it is only by seeing the patient's symptoms and how the patient is uh, there is an improvement in the vitamin deficiencies of the patients there is a weight gain in the patient increase in the bmi because fecal elastase cannot be used for this at some centers fecal chymotrypsin is being used for this purpose because chymotrypsin is included within the pert so therefore it may be used for checking the compliance in the patients uh, thank you one more point uh, so dr mohan uh, raised hand uh, dr philip dr mohan yeah. raised his hand hmm? yeah please go ahead. just a brief comment that apart from all the other benefits that you mentioned neha in people with chronic pancreatitis and diabetes we have seen some improvement in the diabetic uh, condition also because of this exocrine endocrine connection often not uh, recognized but we have seen slight fall in the insulin doses slight improvement in the a1c and the control apart from the, of course the general well being question i have uh, is uh, you know does the replacement of the enzymes have any effect on the lipase or the amylase uh, levels um, we have a you uh, know uh, patient in common uh, vip philip agustin and myself and recently we are, after he st he started the enzyme pancreatic enzyme therapy recently uh, his amylase lipase had been quite, quite steady but somebody said you know you better take this because there may be some subacute pancreatitis or something like that but after taking it after the next visit when we saw there was actually an increase in the amylase and lipase it may be purely coincidental he has had no symptoms in between but i was wondering whether there's any link at all or any study either improvement or increase in the lipase and amylase levels after taking uh, enzyme replacement no sir i don't think i have come across that it has improved the amylase and the lipase it is basically that is improving digestion definitely it is improving the control of diabetes because diabetes is a very brittle diabetes in patients with pancreas difficult to control yeah but not improving the pancreatic parenchyma it's because there's so much of lipase we're giving can little bit get into the blood and can the levels go up It's just theoretically, I was just thinking of this yeah. case. Uh, Doctor Morgan, I also thought it was very interesting. I've asked him, asked him to keep checking his amylase and lipase because this is the first time I saw that uh, yeah. myself. You know, uh, Doctor Morgan, one more thing: people use uh, pancreatic exogram. I mean, uh, uh, enzymes for control of pain in chronic pancreatitis, even if there is no pancreatic exogram. Is there any uh, role for that? What's your comment? sir there have been studies which have used enteric coated pancreatic enzymes for the purpose of controlling pain in patients 
but if we come across around six studies which have been done for this four studies have not shown any benefit and the rest of the two studies have shown a slight benefit of non enteric coated rather than enteric coated enzymes having any benefit in pain so currently the guidelines do not recommend the use of pancreatic enzymes per se for the control of pain in patients with chronic pancreatitis thank you uh, dr ajay you can take up further questions if there are any ajay i think uh, we have covered lots if there's uh, anything more then we can answer them later uh, through email and uh, with that uh, neha please go on to introduce the next chair person dr naresh bhat and then we can go on to the next talk naresh can introduce the speaker yes sir i would now like to introduce dr naresh bhat who is the chair person for the next talk uh, dr naresh bhat is a senior consultant at astral hospitals bengaluru he is also the past president of indian society of gastroenterology and society of gi endoscopy of india sir is also our alumni from pgi and we have heard a lot of beloved stories from sir and considering i am also from pgi uh, sir i would like to welcome you for this uh, session and uh, if you could introduce the speaker please thank you uh, thanks ajay and neha uh, good evening it's a privilege to introduce my good friend uh, dr mohan from chennai for the next talk dr mohan is a very distinguished diabetologist of international acclaim uh, he is a chairman of the uh, diabetic research center uh, in his name and also a large center which caters to uh, over a few lakh patients and he also uh, controls about 50 centers across the country uh, in a lot of uh, states the chief interest of mohan is in epidemiology and of course he has a lot of contributions in the field of um, chronic pancreatitis and diabetes as well and has close to or, or even more than 1000 publications so that speaks a lot about mohan and mohan the next few minutes are all yours thank you uh, naresh let me see whether i can just share my screen can you see it not yet oh okay yeah you're on some you're on okay right thank you so much uh, so thank you uh, naresh uh, when ajay called me and asked me to talk on management of uh, dm3 type uh, 3 diabetes um, this is a term which we you know here in the in the literature and i don't know how it has gotten but everybody at least the gastroenterologists use this term uh, to call pancreatic diabetes or pancreatic uh, secondary diabetes secondary to pancreatic diabetes as dm3 uh, so i'll i'll take you through that and then i'll quickly try to finish after formally thanking ajay uh, neha the organizing committee and naresh for sharing this and for the kind words uh, i have no conflict of interest to declare so if i go to the classification of uh, the american diabetes association in 1997 it has not changed since then although who brought out a small variation last year but basically it's the same so type 1 diabetes where you have ketosis uh children with uh, getting it you will die if you stop insulin and the 100 year of insulin discovery 1921 has discovered a lot being talked about type 1 diabetes and its discovery type 2 diabetes on the other hand uh, insulin uh, secretory defect is less but there is more of insulin resistance rarely developed ketosis they can even be managed with tablets now we come to this category which we are now referring to as diabetes 3 or uh, the uh, third type this actually is called other specific types so the ada uh, had two main types type 1 type 2 the other was other specific type and the fourth is gestational diabetes which is not outside the topic uh, of today's discussion now within the other specific types there are genetic defects of beta cell function and maturity onset diabetes a young modi monogenic diabetes all comes there rare disorders of insulin action endocrinopathies come there cushing syndrome producing diabetes acromegaly producing diabetes drug induced and we're hearing a lot about the steroid induced diabetes now due to covid and and so on infections covid itself producing diabetes and so on so right there 
comes a disease of the exocrine pancreas. And specifically, they mentioned fibrocalcific pancreatitis or alcoholic pancreatitis being the cause of this. So that's why it probably is called as diabetes type 3, although nowhere it really says diabetes type 3. So I don't know how it has come to stick, but many people have started using it. And recently we reviewed a paper and asked them to change it. They refused to change it, saying that, no, this is an established uh, entity and we can't change it and so on. Now, if we talk about uh, how uh, glucose intolerance is related uh, to and diabetes are related to the pancreas in general, you can rarely get acute pancreas. We heard a lot about acute pancreatitis today, but we didn't hear much about diabetes in those uh, sessions, if you, uh, if you remember correctly. Whereas when we started on chronic pancreatitis, Nagi started talking, we had diabetes coming in there. Uh, so it's more in the chronic pancreatitis, although if you have acute pancreatitis, which then damages the pancreas and produces a pseudo system and so on, it can produce it. And then, of course, there are many other causes which I'm not going to go into. Neoplasia also we just discussed now how adenocarcinoma itself can lead to diabetes. And then, of course, your cystic fibrosis. And of course, if you do total pancreatectomy, you can also get diabetes. Why I'm saying this is because the management of all these varies considerably. For example, if you have uh, diabetes secondary total pancreatectomy, it will be very different from one of the others shown above. But let me talk about the commonest that we see in our country, and that's fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes, on which many of you have done a lot of work. Now, the gastroenterologists, like yourselves, see the, the, the pre-diabetic uh, stage of the disease, where you have recurrent abdominal pain, you have steatoria, uh, and at that stage, normal glucose tolerance can be there in a young child who presents with um, pancreatic calcula later on, ductal dilatation, fibrosis. And at that stage, we call it as tropical chronic pancreatitis because there's no diabetes. For diabetes, to call it fibrocalcific pancreatic diabetes, you have to have diabetes. And therefore, that's the next stage of the disorder. And therefore, somebody comes here at this stage, the management itself will be only diet. And of course, there's no way of preventing the diabetes from coming. But I'm going to talk more, mostly about this stage after the diabetes sets in. In other words, FCPD, or you can take that as alcoholic chronic pancreatitis or any other form of the pancreatitis. Now, the big difference, I mentioned that type 1 diabetes occurring in children presents with ketosis. Of course, type 2, we know, doesn't produce ketosis, uh, except very rarely if you have a severe infection. But the classical pattern of the chronic pancreatitis producing diabetes, FCPD, the most studied one, is that they don't have ketosis. In the majority of cases, and I'll show you that exceptionally they can. So in 1983, one of my first studies was to look at why are they not developing ketosis? So we measured C-peptide, both fasting and stimulated. What we found is this is a normal amount of insulin uh, secretion uh, in the pancreas in non-diabetic subjects, in type 2 diabetic subjects. And you see type 1s almost lost. And when you have no insulin secretion at all, then you are prone to ketosis. FCPD or chronic pancreatitis comes somewhere in between type 1 and type 2. And that's why the majority of them need insulin, but they don't develop ketosis. They have just enough pancreatic insulin reserve uh, to prevent ketosis. This is the first study actually in the world to show that. But then later on, we showed that that's not the only reason. There's also glucagon deficiency. You need glucagon from the pancreatic alpha cells to produce uh, ketosis. And if you have the glucagon cells also affected due to chronic pancreatitis, then you don't have the stimulus to produce ketosis. And of course, the very uh, lean people where they have less of body fat to break down could be another reason for the protection from ketosis. Now, let me go straight into the management of ketosis. And we already heard about uh, uh, some the, uh, something about the uh, treatment of abdominal pain, which they come to you. We don't treat them when they come uh, with uh, either several attacks of acute pancreatitis going to chronic pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis itself presenting with um, acute chronic relapsing pancreatitis. The use of pancreatic enzymes has been beautifully covered by Neha. So I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to focus on the management of diabetes itself. Now, when you talk about the management of diabetes, the same principles exist. So as far as diet is concerned, the same principles exist, except that we give a little more calorie intake because these people are lean. Most of them have BMI of 18, 19, 20, 21, not the BMI of 32 and 40, which we see in type 2 diabetes. And therefore, little more calories like we give for type 1 diabetes can be given. A higher protein intake also helps because most of them have some degree of malnutrition. The malnutrition is secondary. It's not the cause of the pancreatitis, but due to the pancreatitis, due to maldigestion, malabsorption, as Neha showed, you can have uh, uh, lower pr protein and therefore uh, the, uh, you have a maldigestion uh, uh, and therefore a higher protein intake is always good. 
Now coming to oral hypoglycemic agents, we have shown that in a minority of patients who have some beta cell function, uh, you can use them. Low dose sulfonylureas can be used. Biguanides we don't normally use because it uh, kills the appetite and we don't, it's not a drug of choice. Now the other newer drugs, like the DPP4 inhibitors, are actually contraindicated if there is a history of pancreatitis because there is a theoretical risk of them producing pancreatitis and therefore they're definitely contraindicated. The other ones like the SGLT2s, again, they produce loss of weight and they produce electrolyte imbalance and therefore they may not be the drugs of choice uh, as far as uh, treatment of chronic pancreatitis and diabetes is concerned. And therefore, the, the cornerstone of uh, treatment of uh, diabetes and chronic pancreatitis would be insulin, which would be needed in the majority of patients to achieve glycemic control. Usually two to three injections of insulin would do, unlike uh, the uh, type one diabetes, where you need four injections or five injections of insulin per day. Here, normally the requirement because the ketosis proneness is less. Occasionally, a basal bolus regime of four injections would be needed. Now, this is a picture I produced many years ago to show the clinical spectrum, which we actually, uh, in this one cartoon, we uh, summarize the whole thing. So if you see, the majority of patients are actually insulin requiring, but a very small percentage of them can actually be ketosis prone because when the damage is total and all the beta cells are gone, maybe 5% of patients are ketosis prone. But the majority, if you take 100 patients of FCPD, almost 90 of them will have ketosis resistant. They require insulin, but they don't develop ketosis. Even if you stop the insulin, sugar will remain at 600, but they won't develop ketosis. And then we have this 5 to 10% of patients who can respond to either diet alone or OHA. And we showed the reason for that. The reason is that the pancreatic damage goes on for some time from the TCP to FCPD progression, but then it kind of gets arrested. And therefore, all the beta cells are not gone, and therefore they respond just like patients with type 2 diabetes, and we publish such uh, case reports. Now, how do you assess the control of diabetes? Well, preprandial sugars around 100 to 120, postprandial around 120 to 160, HbA1c less than 7%. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, I'm sure all of you are, the time and range is a new concept which we use as diabetologists. The time and range throughout the day should be more than 70%. How do you assess time and range? You use this little sensor which you apply on the arm, and then you have a reader, and through the reader, you can either get a retrospective blinded uh, reading, or if you use the uh, Freestyle Libre, uh, you can actually do it on a minute to minute basis. You just need the reader, and any time, 200 times a day, you can check the blood sugar without taking a drop of blood. And then you can get graphs like this. And the shaded area is where we want the sugars to be, between 70 to 180, let us say. You can set whatever limits you like, but I've just set it at 70 as a lower limit and 180 as upper limit. So if you had your sugars within that range, it's called time and range. And you want the time and range to be 100% if possible, but at least 70%. Look at this patient who came to me, a typical patient, uncontrolled diabetes, the time and target was 0%. And the time above target, anything above is called TAR or time above target. Anything below is called TBR or time below target. We don't want both. And here the time above target is 100%. And you can see that the first three, four days after I changed the treatment, I could not get the sugars under control. But to the fifth day, we could see the improvement coming. About 19% was under control. And thereafter, it rapidly improved, 65%, 29%. Uh, and, and so on. And then almost at the, it was coming up to almost 100% on some days under control. We put one more, what we call as AGP or amylate glucose profile. Oops. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, and the, for the same patient, we just followed it up with the next two weeks. And you can see now where the graph was earlier, where everything was above target. Now you can see everything has got under control, then almost 100% of the day, the sugar is under control with 0% above target and 0% below target. Now, this is the essence of what we call as precision diabetes. And today, we're able to maintain such beautiful control almost throughout the day. And you can see at the end of two weeks, 98% of that 24 hours into 14 days was actually under control. Now, when, the, you get managed, when you get diabetes secondary to pancreatic surgery, especially total pancreatectomy, uh, then it's very, very difficult to control the diabetes because the sugars tend to uh, very violently fluctuate. The, glu the glucose variability is huge. Patients are exquisitely insulin sensitive because glucagon is also gone because you removed the whole pancreas. And therefore, you give them five units of insulin, they can get into hypo. You reduce two units, it'll go to 600. And therefore, such patients are best treated with an insulin pump. 
Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to control. And these people actually don't have uh, good prognosis. Many of them die either due to hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. And of course, they will need pancreatic enzyme replacement as well. And therefore, I'd like to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that diabetes secondary to pancreatic diseases, which you call as type 3 diabetes, is a rare but important form of diabetes. One should not miss it. And the reason you should not miss it, because there are two additional components apart from type 1 and type 2 diabetes. One is that they could have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, which if you treat, the quality of life is much better, the control of diabetes is better, they gain weight, and they do very well. And of course, the risk of pancreatic carcinoma has to be kept in mind in some of our publications. It's 1,000 times higher than in the general population, and therefore a high index of suspicion is very important. Most patients need insulin for control. Occasionally, oral drugs can be used. And I'd like to just end by inviting all of you to attend our International Diabetes Update, uh, which is our annual event, which will be held on 30th July, 31st July, and 1st August and I invite you to attend the same. So let me now stop sharing. And if there are any questions, I'm happy. Thanks, thanks, Ramon. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions. One yeah, is yeah. that uh, since we know that they fluctuate so much and hypo is a real problem, I mean, what is your target HbA1c with these patients, or do you not use HbA1c as a target in these patients? We do, Naresh, and then now, I think we have to individualize it in any given patient. So ideally, we would like them to get it below 7. And you know that the normal value is 5.6. So we've still got a 1.4% window. But it depends on the age of the patient, the type of diabetes they have, the, the uh, proneness to hypoglycemia, whether they have any other comorbid conditions, and so on. So for some people, we'll say 7.5 is good enough. Because whatever we try, anything below that, uh, we will get into hypoglycemia. The VIP patient that uh, you know we are talking about, Philips and I, if he brings it below 7.8, he is very uncomfortable because he doesn't have chronic pancreatitis. He's got some mild form of chronic pancreatitis. But if he brings it down anything below 8, he's not at all comfortable. So for him, for years, we have said 8 is enough. Uh, so it all depends on the patient. Finally, the doctor and the patient decides that this seems to be your best level. We are not treating your HbA1c. We are treating you as a person. And therefore, the best... A1C you can get with good quality of life is what we will aim. The second issue is um, you kind of dismissed off the oral hypoglycemic agents to a large extent. Uh, but we do find uh, up to 50% of patients with chronic pancreatitis don't need insulin at all. So they can manage with a small dose of metformin and things like that. And that is what we do. Uh, I would like your comments and also on the use of other oral hypoglycemics. I mean, bigonides, I agree, we don't use. Yep. But what about the uh, glitazones and the anti encretin therapy? There are their own share of problems. And finally, the role of um, low dose metformin in preventing cancer pancreas in chronic pancreatitis. Yeah. So, Anarish, you're right that uh, the type of patients that you see as, that's why I made that picture of where you see them and where we see them. So we see them 10 years later. Uh, so obviously in your own series, the beta cells are still not completely gone. So if you're in your series, I'm not at all surprised that 50% of them require, I mean, only require uh, tablets. As they go on, they it becomes less and less. And probably 10 to 15% of my patients will uh, only be controlled with tablets alone. Now, do I use a combination of tablets and insulin? Of course I do. Because if that helps to reduce the dose of the insulin, uh, radio, make it smoother, and sometimes they have sub 30 percent beta cell function, you might as well use that, and therefore we use that. Coming to the choice of agents, yes, there has been a view that metformin has is pleomorphic in its uh, pleotropic in its uh, in its actions, and for cancer prevention itself, not only pancreatic cancer but many other cancers, metformin has been used. It's been used in the prevention of TB, and has been used in many. It's anti-aging. It's it's got multi. Every year we come up with a new use of metformin. So using metformin is not a bad idea, but you remember it also produces a little bit of uh, abdominal distension, diarrhea, uh, and so on. And therefore, most and then weight loss. And so it's not ideal in chronic pancreatitis, especially in severe, but in small dose we can use. Low dose sulfonylurea is okay because you're using that little bit, doesn't have any effect on the pancreas, then low dose of this is good. DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1, uh, which you mentioned, the incretins, are actually contraindicated because of the risk of pancreatitis, which has been shown. Uh, whether to use it at all and there's one definite contraindication is any history of pancreatitis so if the history of pancreatitis those two drugs 
are gone. SGLT2s are very powerful drugs. Maybe they have an effect on this, but they also produce weight loss. They produce electrolyte imbalance, and um, therefore not too many studies on them. Not the drug of choice. Glitazones they tend to produce uh, you know fluid overload, and they have their own uh, problems. Uh, bladder cancer being one of them. And so glitazones are virtually gone. Virtually nobody is using glitazones. You know, hardly one to two percent of all prescriptions in the world today are glitazones. I've stopped using them long ago because of this bladder cancer and other complications. So that leaves very few oral drugs to be used. Sulfonylureas you can use. Maybe small dose of metformin you can use. And if it's a mild case, they can get along with that. I have a few patients who have never needed insulin, as you said. But that's a very small. Eventually, they'll all need insulin. Provocative well, question. Should yeah. gastroenterologists treat their chronic pancreatitis patients with their diabetes, or should it necessarily go to the diabetologist? Well, Does in early care? cases, you can treat them, <laughs> and as it gets more difficult, probably we'll come in. It's the same thing. Should we uh, treat the pain and the chronic pancreatitis or refer every case to you? If it's mild, we'll continue to give, and I find very good results with the uh, Creon and other things. So I, I use them, but then whenever we need help, then we. If you think that a procedure is needed or something else, then we refer uh, to people like yourself. So. Well, discussion can go on and on and on, but the time is catching up with us. Well, uh, uh, Philips, Naresh, Mohan, and Neha, thank you very much for a, such an exciting and a wonderful uh, presentation and, uh, of course, discussion. Uh, thank you. I know thank there are a number of questions which will be coming up. And probably I'll need your help to answer them because sure. especially uh, for the diabetes part. And uh, <laughs> please send them, Dr. Jekman. Happy to answer. And uh, with that, uh, now we go on to the last session. We started with acute pancreatitis, we went on to chronic pancreatitis, and now we go on to the pancreatic tumors. And uh, as I said right in the beginning, that we have decided tried to select the issues which were less covered in the routine meetings and there are some additional literature in the previous last two years we tried to include that now for the last session we have one case capsule and two lectures but the case capsule well none other than uh, professor adarsh chaudhary i mean uh, who, i mean this is quite a strange that i have to use the same words for all the moderators today that i don't need to introduce them because if you do not know Adarsh, it means you do not know, practice gastroenterology in India. I mean, uh, Adarsh is the chairman of uh, GI surgery, GI oncology at uh, Medanta in Gurugram. And then Manav, uh, who is new to the field of pancreatology, but of course is a hardcore hepatologist and is a, the backbone of my department. I mean, uh, I can't imagine um, working this unit. Uh, our institute, BLK Institute of GI and Hepatology, without him being there, and uh, who is actually always raises his hand first whenever there's an issue. So Manav uh, is a senior director at BLK Institute of Digestive and Liver Diseases. So over to you, Professor Chaudhary and Dr. Manav Badhavan. I don't see photograph of Dr. Darshi. Kya kahani hai sir? Aage ja, aage. Ab dehre mein baithe ho. आप अंधेरे में बैठे हैं मुझे मालूम है कि आपकी आवाज में बहुत तेज है पर लाइट है पर आपकी आवाज कुछ लाइट भी हो जाए तो चेहरे पर तो अच्छा लगेगा सो आई थिंक विदाउट वेस्टिंग मच माय टाइम आई थिंक वी पास ऑन टू मानव यू टेक ओवर द प्रोसीडिंग्स एंड स्टार्ट द प्रोसेस मानव प्लीज कैन आई रिक्वेस्ट द मॉडरेटर कैन आई रिक्वेस्ट द ऑर्गेनाइजर टू लेट मी शेयर द स्लाइड्स आई डोंट हैव दैट ऑप्शन ऑन माय स्क्रीन Please give the slides sharing thing. Manav, in the meantime, you can introduce the panelists. They will. They should. Uh, sure. Sure. So, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rajay. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. The the presentation today is basically going to be on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I know uh, it was supposed to be on multiple endocrine neoplasia, but I thought that we'll strike the core topic rather than beating around the bush. So we'll talk about pancreatic nets. And we have very four eminent panelists with us. Of course, Professor Chaudhary is going to guide us throughout this thing. He is going to answer all the questions. But the four panelists are the focus of this presentation today. We have uh, Dr. Sandeep Lakhtakia. Everybody knows Dr. Sandeep Lakhtakia in pancreatology. He is uh, uh, 
senior director in Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, and we all know his seminal work in the area of pancreas. We have Dr. Amit Agarwal. Amit Agarwal is a very dear friend of mine. We worked together for almost two and a half years, and now he is director of medical oncology in Fortis Shalimar. Uh, Amit, it was a loss to let you go, but uh, we do what we have to do. Uh, we have Dr. Shrikhande. Dr. Shalesh Shrikhande is again HOD, Head of Department, Department of Surgery and Hepatopancreato Biliary Surgery in Tata Memorial Hospital. He is a very eminent surgeon and has a lot of experience in pancreatic surgeries. And the last but not the least, Surinder Rana. So, Surinder Rana is somebody whom I know for almost 30 years, Surinder? Yeah, I mean, we were uh, yeah, MBBS yeah, bachelor's in Nancy. Yeah, since 1993. So we were MBBS batchmates, and now Surinder is a professor in gastroenterology in PGI Chandigarh. I still cannot share my slides. I don't know. Everybody from the technical team will help us. Yeah. On yes, sir. So we have assigned you the slide control, sir. You have assigned it. So uh, it's saying we have to log off and join again, or uh, for getting that option. Maybe that is the case, Manu. No, it's, I think I have to change my settings somehow. Let me see. I, I'm, I'm working on it. Sorry. Just give me a minute. This computer sometimes plays tricks with you. So yes, uh, I think this will do the trick. I think I'll have to log off and uh, join in again. Just give me sir, 30 seconds. Yes, yes sir. The latest count is 858 people, delegates who are logged in and attending live. live. Congratulations, no. Dr. Ajay Kumar. This is thanks to your organization. No, no. It's, a, it's actually the attraction of the subject and the speakers combined. And the program. Obviously, the subject, that's what I meant, the subject program and the speakers, which attracts the people, it keeps the people interesting. So, Salesh, it's a quite a, it's by the two people whom I'm running in frequently, when we don't even uh, talk to each other for years together, in the last week or two, I think you and Mohan frequently got <laughs> Meeting on the web. Uh, yes, and uh, the pleasant surprise for me was to meet Professor Shrikande, I mean, his father, you, I don't know how many of you know, the famous yeah. pancreatic biliary surgeon at the Bombay Hospital. Father figure, and, uh, I had my pleasant, enlightening encounters with him many years back, both in India and in Vienna. I think we are meeting more often on web than in physical life. Yes. Uh, it seems that we are still connected quite often. So. Delicate, please excuse us. Manav is back. I hope he gets his slide sharing. I'm so sorry, sir. But you got your yeah, slides. I'm so sorry. Now I can't hear the slides. Okay, great. Go ahead. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Please okay, go all right. So uh, let's uh, straight away start the show. Just a few slides on pancreatic ne uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, these are getting more and more important these days. We know they arise from enteropromethin cells and Two-third of all uh, next neuroendocrine tumors are GI. Only one-third are pancreatic. So we are going to focus this on pancreatic nets. Now, all neuroendocrine tumors produce some amines and peptides by which we diagnose them. The commonest which we know about is promogranin A. We classify them into functional and non-functional depending on which peptides they are secreting, whether they are causing a functional syndrome or not. And uh, there are some familial syndromes where neuroendocrine tumors are very, very common. The most common uh, uh, in men, one specifically, you almost 100% of patients have a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, if the neuroendocrine tumor secretes a peptide which causes symptoms, it is a functional tumor. The commonest is insulinoma or a gastrinoma. Many other peptides are secreted with those cause, which don't cause any symptoms. They are non-functional peanuts. That's how you broadly classify them. And if you look at the relative frequency, the non-functioning tumors are probably the commonest. Almost 60 to 80 percent of all peanuts are non-functional. If you look at functional ones, insulinoma is the most common, followed by glucagonoma, 
if you look at the functional net the the epidemiology of neuroendocrine tumor you see one functional neuroendocrine tumor in maybe a million population but if you look at the cadaveric data if you look at the autopsy data they are much more common almost 0.5 to 1% of all autopsy specimens will show you a neuroendocrine tumor on autopsy that's how common it is and again reinforces the fact that non functional tumors are much more common than functional ones and as we go down as we go from non functional to insulinoma to glucogonoma the malignancy potential increases the least malignant are non functioning ones insulinoma also is mostly a benign tumor but as you go down on this list the malignancy put malignant potential increases you either diagnose a net on clinical endocrine syndrome or if they become large enough and cause obstructive symptoms that's when you diagnose them so non functional tumors typically present late why because they have to grow enough a big in size to cause symptoms on the other hand the endocrine clinical syndrome caused by insulinoma will present probably early and we will highlight two cases here covering a uh, one a non functional tumor and other one as a functional tumor this is case number 1 this lady 50 year old female came to our emergency with neuropsychiatric symptoms she had confusion diplopia and dizziness the patient was obese she was documented to have a hypoglycemia episode in er was admitted and further investigation showed a high fasting serum insulin and c peptide level so may i uh, against the order, uh, the panelists here so we know this is possibly insulinoma from the clinical history and the first set of investigation so can i ask dr rana what further imaging would you like to have in this patient what is the first investigation you are going to ask when you want to image this this lady yeah, i think uh, the clinical suspicion is often insulinoma and uh, most of the time insulinoma are localized to pancreas so you obviously would like to do a cross sectional imaging first which is non invasive so in this situation obviously you will do a, a pancreas protocol ct scan with where you want to look at the enhancement in the arterial and venous phase and whenever you have a lesion which is hyper enhancing in an arterial phase with a rapid washout that will probably give you a suspicion of a functional net Uh, perfect so uh, mohan talked about a pancreatic protocol ct in the previous presentation so i'm not going to talk about that uh, late arterial and the portal venous phase but what we need to remember here is we also need a delayed phase because there are many of these neuroendocrine tumors have a fibrous component a delayed enhancement in seen in some of these fibrous tumors so we have to add the delayed phase also in the pancreatic protocol here so that's what we did we did a triple phase, phase pancreatic protocol ct and you can appreciate a arterial phase enhancing lesion in the body tail of pancreas and which becomes isodense to the pancreatic parenchyma on the portal venous phase this is classical of a neuroendocrine tumor and uh, again uh, uh, may i ask sarinder again would you like to do a us in this setting in this particular case yeah, if you why if no why and where will you limit that I think EUS is uh, probably important in patients who have suspicion of insulinoma because in many of the patients you can have a multifocality, you can have multifocal lesions. So I think you can do a EUS with two aims. One is to properly characterize the suspicious lesion, which many times on CT you may not be having a very obvious lesion. There may be indirect signs on CT. So on an EUS you can confirm uh, that lesion to be an insulinoma by typical EUS appearances, which is a well-defined hypoechoic lesion in the pancreas and it can be supplemented by doing a contrast us where you can uh, study the contrast enhancement pattern and can be fairly sure of the uh, tumor being a insulinoma or a functional neuroendocrine tumor and then you can screen the other parts of pancreas for any other coexisting small uh, net which has been missed on a even on a properly done uh, biphasic ct scan so i think with these aims us can be done and many times surgeons will ask you to tattoo it with a methylene blue or any dye so that they can better intraoperatively local localize it for uh, excision uh, dr lakshya uh, dr lakshya do you have a difference in opinion or would you agree with the surrender here i would agree with surrender here i can't uh, agree to disagree with surrender he directly <laughs> said that we so would you like to take a tissue diagnosis here sir yes of course i think that's part of uh, i think that surrender also would consider that and i would use a smaller gauge needle because some of these uh, lesions are very vascular as we see on ct and uh, a 25 gauge needle with minimum suction or no suction uh, would be the preferred way of uh, confirming it but how tissue diagnosis can i ask the surgeon to comment on this i'm not too sure whether we should be going for a tissue diagnosis here so I, can i, I ask think, uh, i think uh, manav can i add one thing i'll probably go by the surgeon's uh, opinion if he wants a tissue diagnosis then only i'll do it 
because many times surgeons will find it difficult to excise if i have put a needle so enucleation for them become little difficult so i'll probably go by the advice of my gi surgeon whether he wants a tissue diagnosis or not dr shikhande would you like to comment i think uh, surinder made a very valid point it is makes a lot of sense to have a discussion if a, if a tumor is eminently resectable you don't need to put a needle in it if there are it's going to change a the decision then possibly you need to biopsy do you agree surinder yes sir i agree sir yeah i think uh, i would i would also say that yes we you know you have got such a classic history and you've got such an excellent ct scan plus you have the biochemical tests uh, which are helping you so on such a background i do not see a need for an additional test especially if the scan is not showing any other lesions elsewhere unless you are truly worried about multicentricity where i would agree with you or small lesions or a situation where uh, you know non functioning tumors where you want to observe etc but in such a case i think we need not do any us would that sound too provocative to my uh, endoscopy colleagues or would they agree with me in a in a tumor board for such a case so uh, in fact if you ask me sir i would uh, i am not a us guy so uh, but if you ask me when you are talking about the insulinoma i will i may possibly agree with you because insulinoma tend to be a single lesion they are not generally exactly. multi centric but exactly. if you are talking about a gastrinoma it is imperative and mandatory to do endoscopic ultrasound to look for other lesions because your plan may change sure. instead Absolutely. of just dissecting the tail of the pancreas you may be looking at a total pancreatectomy if you have a gastrinoma or maybe a duodenal excision also sure so i was restricting my discussion only to this specific case but i get your point and i agree with you and also mana is worth commenting here gastrinomas have a greater potential for malignancy as compared to this so that's okay carry on, please perfect uh, thank you sir thank you uh, just a additional point we talked about multiple endocrine neoplasias men one syndrome we need to understand that men one syndrome the incidence of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is to the tune of 100% so it has us may have a role in surveilling these guys not in any other patient but if you have a men one syndrome you may like to do a surveillance endoscopic ultrasound to look at detecting these lesions early agree agree with any you completely uh, so uh, any any further imaging uh, would you like to have uh, again may i ask the surgeon here dr shikhande would you like any further imaging before you go in and operate or no, you are happy with just because, a ct scan no a good triphasic ct scan in a lesion of that kind of a size is is absolutely fine unless you have serious concerns where you want to add a dota scan uh, for pancreatic neuroendocrine okay. tumors which are uh, larger in size and especially if they are asymptomatic we would always incorporate a dota scan if your lesion is 2 cm or more than above so that we have a good baseline staging we are very clear that there is no disease elsewhere and the light up is only in the pancreatic uh, body and tail as your ct scan has so uh, beautifully shown uh, in this case um, it's a matter of conjecture because you have symptoms you have classic symptoms you have insulin which is high on fasting and you have this lesion so i'm not even sure that you just now need an additional investigation okay uh, amit uh, what do you think what is your comment on a dota scan in such a patient or in general a neuroendocrine tumor would you ask for a dota scan in all patients or would you ask for only specific okay, amit so this patient definitely doesn't merit dota scan on its own i mean you have to go yes each case goes Uh, but uh, to be specific about this case, I don't think there's any additional incremental benefit if you were to do a dota scan. I, I would, I would, if the patient has to have an excision surgical uh, thing done, and there's no reason to believe that um, there is other metastasis, then I think it's there is no added additive benefit of dota scan. So I think in this case, I just go with what everybody else said. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Just one point I thought I'll make. In case we want a dota scan, not for insulinoma. We obviously in this case we all agree we don't need it. Let's say we are talking about a gastrinoma. We want to see if they have you have multiple other lesions or not. We would prefer a dota tip PET scan as compared to a scintigraphy or ophthalmo scan. So in older days, ophthalmo scan used to be the investigation of choice in these patients. Nowadays, if you have to get one, you have to get a dota PET scan, which is a better investigation. Right. 
so that's what we anyways did one dota scan it uh, just for the record purpose and uh, you see a lighting up lesion in the tail of pancreas as we had seen previously in the ct no additional information required so you can skip that scan straight away now we know we have a resectable lesion it's a insulinoma we don't need a tissue diagnosis possibly eus may or may not be indicated dr shikhande what would you do you would operate and how would you so, operate so and what surgery would you do yeah so the particular lesion that you shared with us it seems to be a lesion which may not be ideal for enucleation so the patient pre operatively will have to be counseled for a resection if you are easily able to enucleate fine but you have to be very careful about its relationship to the pancreatic duct bland pancreatic fistulas can be extremely troublesome with long morbidity may not be mortality but morbidity we know that the mortality of a distal pancreatectomy is now 1% or less than 1% so to answer your question first i would prefer resection over enucleation for the case that you have shown to us but in smaller tumors we also do an enucleation and i think we can do this by minimal invasive surgery because it is away from all the critical blood vessels the tumor is not very large and you can do this by laparoscopic techniques or by a robotic approach i would also consider doing a distal pancreatic splenectomy uh, and then of course the patient would also require splenectomy prophylaxis for about 10 days prior to surgery and then we would do a resection by minimal access approach thank you dr shelley uh, dr choudhary uh, any comments on this sir Dalish made a very valid point. When you do an EUS and CT apart from the tumor, we always want to see its relationship to the pancreatic duct, which is a very very important information. Because if you just enucleate it and you damage the pancreatic duct, that's a problem. Thank you, sir. So what we did was okay. Oh, before we go further, what we did? Uh, but let me ask uh, Dr. Sandeep Lakakia here. Any role do you think? Is uh, uh, is there of a US direct ablation of a peanut in this case, or in which case would you like to do it if you have to choose one? Now, this is a straightforward case. I think if he's surgically fit, he should go for surgery. But if those who are not fit for surgery for a variety of reasons, then we can think of uh, US direct ablation methods. So, what, what ablation method do you use, sir? You use the RFA or alcohol ablation, and uh, how uh, how your results have been? so we have done uh, we have some experience in uh, insuloma ablation in patients who are unfit or uh, for variety of reasons and we have preferred uh, rfa even carried rfa uh, compared to alcohol uh, which is quite safe uh, the only caveat is the risk of pancreatitis which can occur if the duct is too close any duct which is less than 5 mm or less in the periphery of the lesion then uh, we prefer to place a pancreatic stent uh, prophylactically by ERCP and also use rectal endomethacin and the results uh, so are that, quite quite, uh, quite gratifying okay so in there your comments on this yeah, yeah i agree with dr sandeep personally i don't have any experience with rfa we have used alcohol in few patients but again pancreatitis is an important uh, problem with uh, ablation especially with alcohol sometimes alcohol can pass out into the duct despite doing a proper mrcp you can never be sure whether it is communicating with duct or not so you need to do a proper eus carefully look at the duct the duct sizes which is adjacent to the lesion and then accordingly prophylactically either put a pd stent or if it's a periphery localized lesion then you can go ahead with an alcohol ablation uh, carefully with the methods which have been well described in the literature mana we have lost your slide and your voice yeah yeah we can see you but we can't hear you you have to unmute yourself manav i guess no i one muted myself i don't know where my slides are no, no, we can hear you yeah, we can hear you on. okay we can hear you loud and can clear. you see my slide no no we can't see Sorry. the slide you can read okay. out no problem now they now, now we are Okay, so what we did was we did a laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy. The experts have made it very clear that ablation of peanuts is only for those patients who are not candidates for surgery. So that's what we did. A laparoscopic distal pancreatic patient did well. Let's move, quickly move on to second case. Now this is a metastatic non-functional peanut. The patient came to us with pain abdomen, 
recurrent vomiting had already undergone endoscopy outside which they found extensive compression the guy has got ultrasound done and which showed a large lesion in the pancreas as well as in the liver we straight away went and did a triple phase ct and this is what you see a large lesion in the pancreatic head region with multiple metastatic lesion in the liver so we have a metastatic non functional pnet presenting with the pain abdomen and recurrent vomiting of course you will do a us guide fn ab here uh, the experts have already made it very clear because here you want to classify which kind of tumor you have and decide further treatment based on that so we did a fn ac and uh, the specimen stain positive for chromogranin synaptophysin ki67 was more than 2% so this is a malignant tumor which you are looking at so uh, let me focus on the question here so first symptom the patient has come with is vomiting the patient has a possibly a gastric outlet obstruction although it is not a classical one because the scope was negligible across the entrum extensive compression so uh, 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 dr rana what would you like to do here would you like to send this guy there is extensive compression there is no tumor but the patient does have symptomatic uh, uh, gastric outlet i think first probably we will like to accurately characterize the tumor whether it's a g3 net or a neuroendocrine carcinoma because you know the options are all together different for these two categories of tumors so if if it's a neuroendocrine carcinoma obviously the patient needs a systemic chemotherapy and you need to palliate that patient so if the palliation is to be done uh, it's always preferable to do it in a minimally invasive way you can do a stenting but again i like to discuss this case with in a tumor ward with an oncologist and the surgeon many times surgical debulking of a metastatic tumor if it is feasible can uh, help the patient so amit uh, uh, i think it's quite clear that this is a neuro endocrine carcinoma the way it has metastasized the way it is in, uh, it is causing a compression in the stomach the way there are multiple metastases inside the liver obviously it's a neuro endocrine carcinoma so before i move to amit let me ask dr shri khande would you think a debulking would help here would you like to uh, so obviously this is a multiple metastases but if you see a metastasis to a single lobe maybe a left lobe or a right lobe and you have a large tumor causing gastric outlet uh, so would you would you so, like a surgery in such a case or not so i think before you take me to surgery i'm sorry but i would prefer to comment on what you said earlier you can get a yes. large number of tumors uh, which can be large in size in the pancreas and in the liver the way you see and they can be grade 1 or grade 2 by who 2017 classification easily so for all you know these people might still live for 3 years and 4 years and 5 years and 6 years if the grade is a low one so i would say that i would agree with dr rana that if you have done a biopsy we need with immunohistochemistry a who grading for us to know what is the kind of prognostication we are looking if you are looking at a long term possibility then i am not even sure that i would prefer an endoscopic stenting i would rather prefer a surgical bypass that's my first half which you did not ask me but i felt i should make a comment here to come to your specific question about debulking unless and until you are able to truly debulk uh, about 80 90 i know there is some data that you can debulk about 70% of the liver and then it can still help you but here you have an asymptomatic neuroendocrine tumor you have disease which is on both sides of the liver so your debulking is not going to be an easy straightforward procedure secondly more than debulking you also i suppose have a primary which is somewhere else and i would like to know how the primary is in terms of its resectability otherwise sometimes if you are able to do the primary as a complete resection you leave it as a liver limited disease and based on the grade of your neuroendocrine tumor you can decide on a combination of prrt or chemotherapy and the last thing would be that if it is a higher grade 2 i need now in this case compared to our previous case i need a dual imaging i need a dota as well as an fdg pet and that will help me to strategize my patients either for prrt versus cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, for these patients if it is great so, so we we so this is amit domain dr selesh we i'm sorry mm -hmm. please carry on please carry on uh, if it is grade 3 neuroendocrine carcinoma or poorly differentiated they are going to behave like a terrible bad uh, bad adenocarcinoma last stage last days that kind of a thing 
So Amit, uh, uh, this guy had a completely unresectable pancreatic lesion. It was engulfing the artery. It was engulfing the vein. There was multiple metastases in the liver, and this guy had symptomatic obstruction where we felt that stenting will not help. Why? Because uh, there was no ob uh, obvious infiltration in the liver uh, in the stomach, but there was extensive compression which was causing the symptoms. What do you think should be done in this case? The biopsy did show a Ki and Ki index which was high, and this was more like a neuroendocrine carcinoma. Mm, that's for me, Amar. Yeah, yeah, Amit, please. But can we go back to the pathology side uh, because Shailesh had actually started a very good discussion. Uh, one below, where the biopsy slides were there. I'm sorry, I'm uh, if you can go to the biopsy slide, there were cases. Uh, Shailesh has raised a very nice point. Um, uh, uh, the next one. There, there was a KI-67. I just want to reciprocate few points here very nicely made. Um, if you, yeah. uh, obviously Shalish is here. If you look at this KI-67 scoring, it will be somewhere like 5% or 10% of scoring. If you were to go by a single slide, it will be a grade 2 neuroendocrine tumor. It will not be a neuroendocrine carcinoma. And I would like to reiterate two points which Shalish has made and they are very important that uh, grade one and grade two tumors, neuroendocrine tumor, and even well differentiated grade three tumors are known to metastasize. So the presence of metastasis should not be taken as sign to a non for a carcinoma. Second point that he very, he very nicely made was a PET of both types, both of Totanoff type and of FTG PET. So all well differentiated tumors are largely likely to take Totanoff. And that has a value in delineating where the disease is for the surgeons also. It also has a partial value where whether your sandostatin would work or not work. Also, it has a value to predict whether your PRRT, which requires these uptake, would work or not. And higher the grade of the tumor, particularly if it is neuroendocrine carcinoma, that is the place where a routine FTG 18 PET CT scan possibly has more value. And that is a place which we were calling carcinoma where possibly Dotanoff may not say anything. And also there are cases which I think what Shalesh was trying to allude to, there are cases which are heterogeneous. There are cases in which there are areas which are picking up Dotanoff and there are areas which are high grade, very, very high grade, which are taking up um, FDG 18. So that's what is important. And in neuroendocrine carcinoma, usually the KI-67 is like, 70% and 80% and 90%. And the slide given may not be truly representative, but the slide given is something like 5% to 10%. So now we come down to the question answer. So the sequence of event in a neuroendocrine tumor or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, which one to be used first or second, is not a very clearly known thing. I mean, it is based on when you see the patient and talk to the patient, there are a number of patients who are non-functioning, not very symptomatic and they actually can be observed obviously we're talking about no surgical intervention and and and, and those has been sorted you always ask a surgeon uh, he specifically mentioned 80 percent to 90 percent 90 percent because there is actually a data on ability to reduce by 85 percent so that's i think how he's coming down to that too if you can have an 85 percent resection of primary and secondary it has a meaningful value but anyway so we have observation we have uh, sandostatin, as you mentioned. We have uh, chemotherapy because uh, pancreatic cancer is chemosensitive. We have PRRT, and if it will scratch our brain, then we we'll possibly come with everything. Something else. So highly sensitive, highly symptomatic patient would require chemotherapy. Somewhere in between will require sandostatin or oral TPIs like sunitinib, evrolimus. And somebody would only require centrostatin. And there are a group of patients who are not symptomatic, lower grade patients. They will live without treatment, despite our effort to give treatment, and they do well without treatment. So it's an individual discussion of the patient. Shalish, is that correct? Amit, can I ask a question? I would, I would Sorry, yeah. Shalish, go ahead. Shalish, you first. Hi, sir. No, sir, I'm, I'm, I just said that he said, is Shalish there? I said, yes, I would agree. Amit, uh, 
Is there any uh, data on, or just my provocative question, uh, to use the term to say you had given chemotherapy for neuroendocrine tumors? Should I take that? Yeah, I, I asked Amit or anybody. I just for the audience, I wanted to have a provocative yes. question from Amit. So I so think you your it. provocative question is perfectly timed because we don't have high levels of evidence for any sort of neoadjuvant treatment in, in inverted yeah. form of borderline resectable or locally <laughs> advanced or metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. But having said that, if we deem some of these large non-functioning lesions as having a large level of contact with a vein or requiring extensive resection of the primary, uh, we are currently running, at least in Tata, we are running a protocol of PRRT combined with chemotherapy and we will get some information in the next uh, year or so. So yes, there is in inverted commas some attempts towards new adjuvant chemotherapy plus minus PRRT. Thanks, in some cases, we clearly had encouraging results. Just the That's way right. we began for a few yeah. cases of pancreas once upon a time. Then we started doing this for rectum with neo adjuvant. The same kind of thing is developing now. But we don't have high levels of uh, level one evidence for neo adjuvant approaches. Thank you. I just wanted to touch that. Dr. Chaudhary, I think we'll have to conclude it in the next couple okay. of minutes. We're done, sir. We are done, sir. So what we did here was we just gave chandrochetin LAR. We did not do any surgery or stenting. The lesion regressed at least for some time. The patient did improve his vomiting. Then I lost follow-up of this patient after three or four months. So that's that's where we are. Thank you. I think uh, I thank all the uh, panelists and the uh, moderator, Dr. Adarsh Chaudhary, for helping us out in this. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Neha, yeah, you take over from here? Yes, sir. We will now move on to our second, uh, the last session. There will be two lectures for this session. The chairperson for the first lecture is Dr. B. D. Goswami. Sir is a leading gastroenterologist and hepatologist at the Dispur Hospital, Guwahati, and the ex HOD at the Guwahati Medical College. Sir, I would like to, I would request you to please introduce our speaker. Thank you, Neha. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rajesh Puri. Rajesh Puri doesn't uh, need any introduction. Everybody knows him. He is from Madan Medicity Gurugram. So I'd like to request uh, Dr. Puri to speak on the cystic lesions of the pancreas as well as the algorithmic approach what we have. Thank you. Please, Puri now. Thanks, PD, for joining. But before Rajesh uh, uh, starts, let me make an important uh, announcement. It's a uh, right time to, uh, for his lecture because what I want to share with everybody that I want to, I mean, I want to, on behalf of you all, I will like to congratulate Dr. Rajesh Puri, who is taking over as the next secretary of the Society of GI Endoscopy of India. Congratulations to you. And we have high hopes on you, Rajesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for giving this opportunity. And thanks to Dr. B.D. Goswami for giving the introduction. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk practical algorithm approach to the cystic lesion of the pancreas. I'm going to discuss a case and we'll try to give three answers. What are the tools available? to diagnose the cystic lesion of the pancreas, how accurate they are, and how to interpret it. I will discuss with the case, 40-year-old female who presented with a 2.9 centimeter cyst in the head of the pancreas and this was detected incidentally on contrast and on CT scan. On CT scan, there was a doubt, full communication with the main pancreatic duct, and the main pancreatic duct was 3 millimeter in diameter. And CT scan, the radiologist has made the diagnosis of 
serous cyst adenoma or a side branch ipmn this young lady has no history of pancreatitis no history of jaundice no history of diabetes and no family history of pancreatic cancer she was subjected to endoscopic ultrasound examination which again shows a thin walled unilocular cyst there was no solid component us guided fna was done and the ca of that fluid was 410 nanogram per ml amylase was 8000 cytology shows no atpia and molecular marker show gene genas mutation and the string sign was present just for the those who are learning us the string sign means if you hold the material between your thumb and index finger and it can expand for 1 cm for 1 second that indicate this is called as string sign if you look at the pancreatic cystic lesion they are either of a very low low malignant potential or no malignant potential these are the pseudo cyst and serous cyst adenoma and they don't require any surveillance on the other hand spen and the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma they are malignant and they require surgical intervention while ipm they have malignant potential so they either require a surveillance or require surgical intervention the role of imaging is to characterize the type of cyst to stabilize whether the cyst is communicating with the pancreatic duct or not to differentiate a benign from the malignant cyst and to assess for the presence of a pancreatic cancer the critical question is how accurate ct and mri is so this is the study which was published in pancreatology 2013 this is a systemic review of 19 studies more than 1000 patient and that shows ct scan and mri has diagnosing the type of cyst the accuracy is only 40 to 50% and to differentiate benign versus malignant the accuracy goes to 55 to 80% so ct and mri are good but they are not perfect when you compare between the ct and mri i think mri is better because it give a better morphological evaluation it gives the details about the mural nodules and the best is it give the idea about communication with the pancreatic duct is there or not and there is no radiation exposure Characterizing the cystic lesion of the pancreas is endoscopic ultrasound. But one point I would like to highlight: EUS is not the panacea. EUS has sensitivity of 78 percent, specificity of 67 percent for differentiating the type of cystic lesion of the pancreas, and EUS is most sensitive for solid component, which is seen in the cystic neoplasm. Other advantage of EUS is you can do the EUS guided sampling. and what you are going to see in the sampling the commonly sent sample is for ca and amylase the low level of ca less than 5 nanogram is seen in the serous cyst adenoma or pseudo cyst of the pancreas high ca of more than 192 seen ipm and mcn and if somebody has more than 92 it is very specific to differentiate between mucinous and non mucinous ca is not the marker to differentiate malignant and non malignant it is a marker to differentiate are you dealing with a mucinous cyst or you are dealing with a non mucinous cyst cytology you will come to know about the mucin suggest about ipm and or mcn and you know about the high grade dysplasia or cancer but the problem is this is a study by d jong from the netherland more than 2500 patient and what they have seen 50% cases they are unable to get the cyst fluid and in two third of the patient sample reported to be inadequate because mucin is very thick it is very difficult to aspirate to improve the cytology to improve the analysis of the cyst fluid the molecular markers have come up and the genas is present in the ipmn keras mutation is seen in ipm and mcn and vhl is seen in the serous cyst the newer tool in the form of contrast us for better delineation of the mural nodules and the few papers are there for the confocal laser microscopy or us guided microbiopsy from the cyst wall to know the nature of the cyst so could this patient this young lady 40 year who has no history of pancreatitis unilocular cyst in the head of the pancreas could she have pseudo cyst 
pseudocysts are the commonest benign cystic lesion of the pancreas but if you look at if you remember our patient has no history of pancreatitis therefore i think this lady unlikely to have a pseudocyst so the pseudocyst is out from our list could she has serous cyst adenoma which is 75% seen in the female in fifth to sixth decade generally they are single locally located anywhere in the pancreas in the head body and tail but the important point is there is no communication with the pancreatic duct in the serous cyst adenoma and the typical serous cyst adenoma are microcystic with the central scar and calcification but you may have a macrocystic which give the appearance of a pseudocyst or a side branch ipmn if you do a cyst fluid analysis they have a low cea no mucin and vhl mutation is seen and this is the study which was published in gut 2016 more than 1000 patient and what they have seen the risk of adenocarcinoma in the serous cyst is only 0.1% so these if patient has a serous cyst adenoma they don't require any surveillance so if you remember our patient who underwent eus which is a high ca level 410 while in the serous cyst adenoma ca level is low and our patient has communication with the pancreatic duct serous cyst adenoma has no communication with the pancreatic duct so serous cyst adenoma is ruled out from the differential diagnosis sometime cancer of the pancreas especially the spun or the neuroendocrine tumor can present as a cystic degeneration but most of the time when you do the high quality imaging either ct scan mri or the eus they have a solid component and in this young lady there was no solid component so chances of the cancer of the pancreas is unlikely now we are left with the ipmn and mcn which has malignant potential so could this lady have a mucinous cystic neoplasm which is 95% of the time seen in the females in the fourth decade they are single but 90% of the time they are located in the body and tail of the pancreas they have no connection with the pancreatic duct cyst fluid has a high ca mucin pose positive but the keras mutation is there they have a risk of cancer but if the cystic neoplasm mucinous cystic neoplasm of less than 3 cm with no worrisome feature chances of malignancy is very less so if you remember our patient who had a cyst in the head of the pancreas while mcn is more common in the body and tail of the pancreas and communication with the pancreatic duct was there in, in in the case lady while the mucinous cystic neoplasm has no communication and it has a keras mutation so unlikely to have a mucinous cystic neoplasm so what we left is an ipmn and as this lady has a pancreatic duct of 3 mm so the possibility of side branch duct ipmn is very high so when we look at the ipmn there may be a branch duct ipmn where the pancreatic duct is not dilated main duct ipmn where the pancreatic duct is more than 5 mm and the mixed type when the duct is dilated more than 5 with a cyst in the side branch so main duct more than 5 mm with the no pancreatic cyst without evidence of any obstruction is the main duct ipmn mixed ipmn as an mpd of 5 mm with the cyst so the clinical key is main duct ipmn mixed duct ipmn has a risk of high grade dysplasia and cancer and they require close surveillance when we talk about the branch duct ipmn they have a equal distribution among the male and female they have a communication with the pancreatic duct 40% of the time they are multiple our lady has a single cyst they may be located anywhere in the pancreas cyst fluid have a high c and mucin is positive and they may have keras or genas mutation this lady our patient has a genas mutation to so the clinical key with the side branch ipmn most likely most of the time they don't develop pancreatic cancer but they have malignant potential so majority of them require the surveillance and how, how do you follow these cases if the cyst size is less than 1 cm you require two yearly mri or us examination if cyst size is between 2 to 2 cm then you require a follow up every year and if cyst size is 2 to 3 cm 
a surveillance requires six to 12 months. And if cyst size is more than three centimeter, then you require six monthly. If the size persistent remain for four years, then you can increase the duration of surveillance. And same with if cyst size remain one to two centimeter for more than three years, then you can prolong the duration of the surveillance. Now, if cyst size is more than three centimeter, and has an associated jaundice or history of pancreatitis or elevated CA19-9 on imaging if there is a mural nodule or MPD more than 5 cm, cyst more than 3 cm or cytology shows a high-grade dysplasia or cancer, these patients should be subjected to multidisciplinary. If during the time of surveillance patient develop new onset of diabetes or worsening of diabetes, then the surveillance period may be reduced to 6-month period. Now, question comes, many of the time you come across with the cystic neoplasm, question comes, when can you stop the surveillance? And the answer is very difficult. The only thing is, if patient has the age of more than 75 and they are not the candidate for surgery, then you can stop the surveillance. Our lady, when they are surveillance, after two years, she developed increase in the size of cyst to 3.5 centimeter with presence of mural nodule. And on cytology, there was an ATPA. She was subjected to the surgery, and that shows a non-invasive cancer. So how do you follow these patients after surgery? How do you do the surveillance? Pseudocyst, serous cyst adenoma, or MCN, on surgery, when there is a non-invasive cancer, you don't require any follow-up. IPMN require lifelong follow-up, and pancreatic cancer after surgery require five years. So to summarize, I think stepwise algorithmic approach should be done. EUS is an important integral diagnostic tool, but it is not a panacea. EUS has an advantage because not only the morphological characterization, you can do the cytological, you can do the cyst fluid and the molecular marker. And now we have a contrast EUS or elastography that help in knowing about the nature of the disease. Molecular markers hold considerable promise, new technology needed for improving the diagnostic evaluation. Thank you for the patient's hearing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Puri, for your very informative presentation. Already you have uh, shown the time-bound follow-up. I think we are out of time. So over to Neha, probably we have the last lecture again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Goswami. And thank you, Dr. Rajesh Puri, for the excellent lecture. Uh, our second lecture will be on uh, Microbiome and Pancreas by Dr. Roop Jyoti Talukdar. The chairperson for this session is Dr. Manav Vadhava. Sir, I please request you to introduce Dr. Roop Jyoti. Uh, thanks, Neha. So it's my immense pleasure to introduce Roop Jyoti Talukdar. Roop Jyoti is a guy who's done, I think, most of the basic science work in pancreas. He's, he's currently the director of pancreatology in Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad. But to his credit, he is the one guy who is working in pancreas at the basic level. He has the, his own research team, and I'm looking forward to hear from him. Roop Jyoti, please. Yeah, very good uh, evening, Manav. Thanks for that kind introduction. And uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Ajay Kumar Neha, the whole team, uh, for this wonderful meeting. Uh, so let's uh, take a walk through history uh, to begin my talk. So uh, bacteria were actually evolved uh, around say, one billion years ago. And since then, the bacteria came tagged along with all the organisms that evolved up the uh, evolutionary tree. And then humans evolved uh, around 70,000 years ago in Africa. The microbes were tagged with them at that time. And then what happens is there was migration from Africa to the entire world. And the bacteria along with the human migration went all over the world. And now the bacterial profile that we see in the humans, they have lots of cross uh, talk or lots of uh, uh, communication with the organisms of the environment, the animal kingdom, the birds, the amphibians. And this is basically a, a big ecological system where there is close crosstalk among the organisms and the humans. So once uh, the bacteria gets colonized uh, the, in the human infant at the time of delivery, there undergoes temporal changes of this organism all throughout life. 
uh, based on the mode of delivery, the diet they take, host genetic factor, geography, ecology, biodiversity, the list is long. And whenever we talk about uh, microbiome, the gut microbiome, traditionally we think the microbiome is restricted to the intestine and uh, we talk about diseases of the microbiome and intestinal diseases. But now we have uh, a lot of data which uh, clearly shows that the microbiome is also associated with the liver, the pancreas, and even many organs outside the GI system. So in the next 10 minutes or so, my job would be to take you through uh, the microbiome and pancreas, pancreatic diseases. Uh, but since the, we are running short of time, I'll present briefly on all the aspects and maybe later on we can uh, discuss further by email. So the pancreas had been traditionally believed to be a sterile organ. But now what is known is even the pancreas contains gut microbiota. The microbiome into the pancreas can uh, translocate from the gut as it comes from the uh, stomach, duodenum, intestine, they can translocate. And then there is something called the gut pancreatic microbiome axis. And with the understanding of this, many new questions arises actually. Earlier, uh, type 1 diabetes was thought to be autoimmune. Now the question is, is type 1 diabetes linked to the microbiome? Because in the pancreas also the microbiome has been shown to improve immunoregulation, reduce inflammation. The pancreatic microbiome produces a lot of antimicrobial peptides and uh, decrease antimicrobial peptides. The balance is well maintained. So uh, is diabetes related to altered gut microbiota in the pancreas? Is type 3C diabetes or FCPD or pancreatogenic diabetes related to altered gut microbiota within the pancreas? What's happened in pancreatitis? Is the infected pancreatic necrosis, which we usually believe the organism comes from the colon in the second week, do we get infection much earlier because of the altered pancreatic gut microbiota? And of course, in pancreatic cancer, there are several studies that supports that the microbiome is actually responsible for progression of the cancer. So if we look at the diseases, several studies have come up uh, uh, that has evaluated the microbiome and acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, diabetes, and chronic uh, uh, cancer. But all these studies that I have listed here uh, are uh, studies on the bacteria. But one has to remember that the microbiome means not only the bacteria, but also the fungum, the virome, the protozoans, the archaea. So all these forms are ecological system that as a whole is known as the microbiome or the microbiota. So there have been few studies from China and elsewhere that shows that there is alteration in the microbiome in patients with acute pancreatitis. But I think we need to have some more data on acute pancreatitis because uh, of the use of antibiotics early on in acute pancreatitis could change the microbiota because of that. So uh, I will not talk about the microbial dysbiosis in acute pancreatitis, uh, the bacterial dysbiosis in acute pancreatitis. But let me take you through something more um, interesting that is brewing up in my lab. So if we see many of these patients with uh, acute necrotizing pancreatitis have with uh, Waldorf necrosis, with infection, fare very poorly even with the best antibiotics and they develop infections very early on. So what we did for here was we thought, is it the fungus that is causing? Because uh, usually we have a tendency to use antifungus later in the course when they do not respond to the usual antibiotic therapy. And guess what? So this is what we saw. There was lots of altered fungus in the pancreatic necrosis. So these, these were the tissues from the pancreatic necrotic collection, we subjected them to gene analysis uh, and looked at the fungal elements and we found was fungal dysbiosis. So you need not remember the names of this. So what here I'm showing is the altered fungum in the gut microbiome, in the gut, uh, in the world of necrosis fluid, uh, which we collected during drainage and there was a whole lot of changes. So from where did this fungus arrive? So what we did was we also looked at the stool and blood for the fungus and I'm not showing the data of stool here, but even in the blood, the same fungus were there. And now we know that there is gut micro, gut barrier dysfunction in acute pancreatitis. So it is the altered uh, fungum in the intestine that has translocated from the intestine to the blood, and then it has lodged in the world of necrosis and uh, caused fungal infection in addition to bacterial infection. So this leads to an important question. Is the aggressive use of prophylactic antibiotic, even though guidelines say not to use antibiotics early on, but there is a general tendency to use uh, the highest uh, antibiotics from day one of acute pancreatitis. And is that aggressive use of prophylactic antibiotic early on 
responsible for this fungal dysbiosis. So this is an ongoing study and hopefully by the end of this year, early next year, we'll be able to answer that question and we have to wait till then. So let's switch to chronic pancreatitis. So uh, this was the first paper uh, that we had published uh, on the gut microbial dysbiosis in chronic pancreatitis in 2017 using gene um, sequencing techniques. Uh, following that, there have been several other papers. Uh, and if we summarize the results, all papers talk about alteration in the formicutes bacteroides, there's altered diversity of the organism. Uh, there is reduction in butyric producer, which are supposed to be the good guys. But the question here is, is this dysbiosis in CP a cause or effect or a silent, or is it just a silent bystander? So I think if we go a little bit into this study, we'll get the answer. Uh, so uh, there was alteration in the uh, microbiome in the patient with chronic pancreatitis in diabetes and without diabetes. And if we see here, which is the most important part uh, of the study, uh, what we observed was the patients who had chronic pancreatitis with diabetes had a significantly lower level of this organism called Fecalibacterium prosnitzii. And the function of this organism is to build the gut barrier permeability. It produces lots of butyrate, which is important for the gut uh, function, the mucosal function. And once this is lost, the gut barrier permeability tend to decrease. And then when what we also observed was uh, in this organism, there was uh, in this group of patients, chronic pancreatitis with diabetes, there was lots of altered uh, metabolic pathways and lots of LPS synthetic pathways were upregulated. LPS synthesis pathways means lipopolysaccharide, meaning endotoxin. And this endotoxin translocated to the blood and giving a high level of plasma endotoxin in these patients. And that correlated negatively with Fecalibacterium, which means that if this organism is low, gut barrier is gone and there is more endotoxin. And that endotoxin correlated very strongly with the blood glucose, which means that this endotoxin, which is known to produce beta cell dysfunction, is contributing to the diabetes in these patients with chronic pancreatitis. So now we have a, a kind of cause-effect relationship between the microbiome and the uh, diabetes in these patients. And then uh, this is uh, the more recent study that we have uh, published, which shows that the microbiome in type 3C diabetes is entirely different from type 1 and type 2. So patients with type 3C has 63 unique species which are different from type 1 and type 2 which means that the type 3C diabetes uh, microbiome is very unique. And to confirm these studies, we are again uh, going deeper into that. And in this uh, pan-India study with more than 250 uh, patients, uh, what we found was besides having the alteration in the microbial diversity, the microbial richness, the good bacteria came down, there was also alteration in the gut barrier permeability in these patients, which is indicated by this increased level of IAF fatty acid uh, binding protein. There was alteration in the gut barrier and there was apoptosis. The intestinal endothelial cells were dying by apoptosis. So that proves that there is alteration of gut barrier in these patients with chronic pancreatitis, which leads to translocation of the endotoxin leading to diabetes. And this... Uh, Altered bacteria, in fact, do not work alone. So they have a partner in crime, and that is the metabolome, the metabolites in the blood. If we see here, the patients with chronic pancreatitis with diabetes has an entirely different set of metabolites compared to the healthy controls who do not have diabetes. So this means that there is, uh, there could be some interaction. And uh, again, this looks complicated, but there are lots of abnormality in the amino acid metabolism in these patients. And when we looked at the interaction between the microbiome and metabolome, there was significant positive correlation of alanine, the amino acid alanine, which is known to improve insulin secretion with these two good bacteria. Bacteroides vulgatus and ruminococcus are the good guys which are responsible for uh, maintaining the gut barrier, increasing glucose control. And there was also positive correlation with myoinositol. So these two, this amino acid and these uh, metabolite seems to be important in maintaining the blood glucose in collaboration with the microbiome. So if the microbiome is gone, these will be reduced and this uh, blood glucose control goes haywire. So in the last two, three slides, let's talk a little bit about cancer. Uh, so in chronic pancreatitis, again, I had already said, there are several studies uh, that have evaluated the dysbiosis in cancer and people have looked at the oral microbiome, the plasma, the fecal, fecal microbiome, and also the microbiome within the pancreas. And all of them have shown some difference or the other. But uh, what I would like to bring to your attention are two papers. So if we see here, 
Uh, in this paper, uh, there was a significant alteration in the intrapancreatic microbiome in the cancer. But what was more interesting, when the uh, researchers ablated the microbiome within the cancer, the cancer invasiveness was gone, which means that the microbiome had something to do with the invasion and progression of the cancer. And it was seen that the endogenous microbiota could actually cause immunosuppression. So usually the pancreatic cancer, that's a normal biology of cancer. Any cancer, the body mounts up an immune response to ward off the cancer or kill the cancer cells. But when there was alteration in the microbiota, the immunosuppression was crippled and the, patient, the cancer cells could not kill, the body immunity could not kill the cancer cells. That makes the microbiome manipulation as a potential therapeutic target. And this study takes the previous study one step ahead. And if you look here, these lines indicate the patients of pancreatic cancer who had a long survival. They had a good prognosis. And these are the ones who had a bad prognosis. Two different centers, MD Anderson and John Hopkins. And these prognosis or long-term survival was associated with a better microbiome. The, the diversity in this is the composition of the organisms was better in these patients who had a longer survival. So what happened here was the patient who has shorter survival, there was poor immune, there was immunosuppression, uh, was very poor. And here there was immune activation, the patients who lived long, which means that the body's immune mechanism reduced the uh, can cancer cell, killed the cancer cell, and it worked along with the chemotherapeutic agents. So the summary of the study was like the long-term survival displayed a high tumor microbial diversity, the microbiome within the tumor and in fact, this uh, tumor microbiome could predict the uh, PDAC long-term survival. So if the fecal microbiota is tested in this patient, uh, they could give predictive signature. And then this again leads to the contemplation that fecal microbial transplant or gut microbial modulation could be a useful therapeutic target to modulate the tumor immunosuppression and growth. So uh, with the data in pancreas that we have now, I think, uh, the idea that is microbial dysbiosis a chicken or egg uh, controversy has come to rest, at least in context of pancreatic diseases. So what all these studies suggest is pancreatic disease would cause dysbiosis. Dysbiosis could in uh, return cause disease modulation, which could again contribute to the pancreatic disease. So it forms some kind of a vicious cycle. And that leads to the contemplation that these patients probably is going towards what we call personalized therapy. Now we understand the metabolome. Now we understand the microbiome. More data are pouring in from the genomics. So if we combine all this data, that probably would lead to development of personalized therapy based on diet, lifestyle, prebiotics, and what I'd love to call designer probiotics, and of course, fecal microbial transplantation. So I think the future belongs to personalized medicine, at least in pancreatic disease and the microbiome. And with that, I'd like to end my talk acknowledging all this uh, long list of people. The highlighted people are who have been working with me in the microbiome and other pancreatic field. These people worked with me previously, our granting agencies and our collaborators. Uh, thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, Rupjati. That's a, that's a brilliant exposition. I will not ask any questions because we are running behind time. I will hand it over to Dr. Rajiv, please. Well, thanks, uh, Manav and Roop. Uh, Thank you, sir. For Thank a, you, sir. Roop, this is a, actually a great subject, total new insight into the things. And I think we need to learn from you and we'll probably look into these as uh, more detail. Uh, excellent. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, friends, all good things have to come to an end. So we have reached the last session and finished it, the total scientific program. I hope you have enjoyed this all. There have been uh, certain issues of the INR, this thing, time management. We are late by about 40 minutes. We had hoped that we'll cut it down by some other, the, the, some kind of good discussion. You just can't stop it in between. And uh, I hope it has been useful. We will welcome your feedback so that if we have a, any meeting in the future, we can improve upon it. And I promise you that all the questions that have come, they will be answered individually to everybody whosoever has participated in that. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Neha, for a wonderful cooperation in organizing this meeting. 
and uh, of course uh, manav of course is a uh, uh, i don't want to do, do any extra thanks it is his own meeting and uh, uh, that's it uh, and thank you all the faculties and everything and a special thanks to abbott pharmaceuticals to have an unconditional uh, sponsorship of this uh, scientific meeting uh, without their cooperation it wouldn't have been possible for us to do it uh, in today's time thank you very much and hope to see you again and hope to hear from you and stay safe thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you